Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons represented Escalus, Prince of Verona, read by David Muncaster. Paris, a young nobleman, kinsman to the prince, read by M. B. Montague, read by Chris Hughes, and Capulet, read by Andy Minter, heads of two houses at variance with each other. An old man, uncle to Capulet, read by Alan Davis Drake. Romeo, son to Montague, read by Simon Taylor. Mercutio, kinsman to the prince and friend to Romeo, read by Andrew Lebrun. Benvolio, nephew to Montague and friend to Romeo, read by David Nicol. Tybalt, nephew to Lady Capulet, read by Joshua B. Christensen. Friar Lawrence, our Franciscan, read by Alan Davis Drake. Friar John, of the same order, read by Sean McKinley. Balthazar, servant to Romeo, read by Scott D. Farquhar. Samson, servant to Capulet, read by Esther. Gregory, servant to Capulet, read by David O'Connell. Peter, servant to Juliet's nurse, read by Jacina. Abraham, servant to Montague, read by Caliban. An apothecary, read by Lucy Perry. Three musicians, read by Laurie Ann Walden, Ohm 123, and Aaron Walden. Chorus, read by Ancilla. Page to Paris, read by C. J. Nowak. Lady Montague, wife to Montague, read by Christy Nowak. Lady Capulet, wife to Capulet, read by Corey Samuel. Juliet, daughter to Capulet, read by Elizabeth Clett. Nurse to Juliet, read by Kristen Hughes. Servants to Capulet, read by Abigail Bartels and Lizzie Driver. Three Watchmen, read by Caliban, Jacina, and Brafery. Citizens, read by Rice Lawson and Laurie Ann Walden. Stage Directions, read by David Lawrence. The Prologue of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. Enter Chorus. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, Where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, Whose misadventured piteous overthrows, Doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, And the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Exit. End of Prologue Act I of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act I. Scene I. A public place. Enter Samson and Gregory, armed with swords and bucklers. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. No, for then we should be coalers. I mean, and we be in collar, we'll draw. Ay, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. I strike quickly, being moved. But thou art not quickly moved to strike. A dog of the house of Montague moves me. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runst away. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take the wall of any man or maid of Montague's. That shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. True. And therefore women, being the weaker vessels, are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore I will push Montague's men from the wall, and thrust his maids to the wall. The quarrel is between our masters, and us their men. 
tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be cruel with the maids. I will cut off their heads. The heads of the maids? Ay, the heads of the maids, or their maiden heads. Take it in what sense thou wilt. They must take it in sense that feel it. Me they shall feel while I am able to stand. And tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. Draw thy tool. Here comes two of the house of Montagues. My naked weapon is out. Quarrel, I will back thee. How? Turn thy back and run? Fear me not. No, Mary, I fear thee. Let us take the law of our sides. Let them begin. I will frown as I pass by, and let them take it as they list. Nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is disgrace to them if they bear it. Enter Abraham and Balthazar. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Is the law of our side if I say I? No. No, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir. But I bite my thumb, sir. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. But if you do, sir, am for you. I serve as good a man as you. No better. Well, sir. Say better. Here comes one of my master's kinsmen. Yes, better, sir. You lie. Draw, if you be men. Gregory, remember thy swashing blow. They fight. Enter Benvolio. Part, fools! Put up your swords! You know not what you do! Beats down their swords. Enter Tybalt. What? Art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon my death. I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword, or manage it to part these men with me. What? Drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Have at thee, coward. They fight. Enter several of both houses, who join the fray. Then enter citizens with clubs. Clubs, bills and partisans, strike, beat them down. Down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. Enter Capulet in his gown, and Lady Capulet. What noise is this? Give me my long sword, oh. A crutch, a crutch. Why call you for a sword? My sword, I say. Old Montague is come, and flourishes his blade in spite of me. Enter Montague, and his Lady Montague. Thou villain, Capulet, hold me not, let me go. Thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Enter Prince, with attendants. Rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, Profaners of this neighbour stained steel, Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts, that quench the fire of your pernicious rage, with purple fountains issuing from your veins, on pain of torture from those bloody hands? Throw your mistempered weapons to the ground, and hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil brawls, bred of an airy word, by thee, old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets, and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield old partisans in hands as old, cankered with peace, to part your cankered hate. If you ever disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace for this time all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me. And Montague, come you this afternoon, to know our farther pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. Exeunt, Prince and Attendants, Capulet, Lady Capulet, Tybald, Citizens, and servants. Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew, were you by when it began? Here were the servants of your adversary and yours, close fighting ere I did approach. I drew to part them. 
in the instant came the fiery Tybalt with his sword prepared, which, as he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung about his head and cut the winds who, nothing hurt withal, hissed him in scorn. While we were interchanging thrusts and blows, came more and more and fought on part and part, till the prince came, who parted either part. Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him to-day? Right glad I am he was not at this fray. Madam, an hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east, a troubled mind drave me to walk abroad, where, underneath the grove of sycamore that westward rooteth from the city's side, so early walking did I see your son. Towards him I made, but he was ware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. I, measuring his affections by my own that are most busied when they're most alone, pursued my humour not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. Many a morning hath he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs. But all so soon as the all-cheering sun should in the farthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from light steals home my heavy sun, and private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, and makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humour prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. My noble uncle, do you know the cause? I neither know it, nor can learn of him. Have you importuned him by any means? Both by myself and many other friends. But he, his own affection's counsellor, is to himself, I will not say how true, but to himself so secret and so close, so far from sounding and discovery, as is the bud bit with an envious worm, ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air, or dedicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, we would as willingly give cure as no. See where he comes! So please you, step aside. I'll know his grievance, or be much denied. I would thou wert so happy by thy stay to hear true shrift. Come, madam, let's away. Exit Montague and Lady. Enter Romeo. Good morrow, cousin. Is the day so young? But new struck nine. Ay, me. Sad hours seem long. Was that my father that went hence so fast? It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which, having, makes them short. In love? Out. Of love? Out of her favour, where I am in love. Alas, that love so gentle in his view Should be so tyrannous and rough in proof. Alas, that love, whose view is muffled still, Should without eyes see pathways to his will. Where shall we dine? Oh, me, what fray was here! Yet tell me not, for I have heard it all. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate? O oh, anything of nothing first create! O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep, that is not what it is. This love feel I, that feel no love in this. Dost thou not laugh? No, cause I rather weep. Good heart at what? At thy good heart's oppression. Why, such is love's transgression. Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, Which thou wilt propagate to have it pressed With more of thine. This love that thou hast shown Doth add more grief to too much of mine own. Love is a smoke raised with the fume of sighs, Being purged, a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, Being vexed, a sea nourished with lovers' tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, A choking gall and a preserving sweet. Farewell, my coz. Going. Soft, I will go along, And if you leave me so, you do me wrong. Tut, I have lost myself, I am not here, This is not Romeo, he's some other where. Tell me, in sadness, who is that you love? What, shall I groan and tell thee? Groan? Why, no, but sadly tell me who. 
bid a sick man in sadness make his will. Ah, word ill urged to one that is so ill. In sadness, cousin, I do love a woman. I aimed so near when I supposed you loved. A right good markman, and she's fair, I love. A right fair mark, fair cuz, is soonest hit. Well, in that hit you miss, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. She hath Diane's wit, and in strong proof of chastity well armed, from love's weak childish bow she lives unharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor ope her lap to saint-seducing gold. Oh, she's rich in beauty, only poor, that when she dies, with beauty dies her store. Then she hath sworn that she will still live chaste? She hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste for beauty, starved with her severity, cuts beauty off from all posterity. She's too fair, too wise, wisely too fair, to merit bliss by making me despair. She hath forsworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead that live to tell it now. Be ruled by me. Forget to think of her. Oh, teach me how I should forget to think. By giving liberty unto thine eyes, examine other beauties. Tis the way to call hers exquisite in question more. These happy masks that kiss fair ladies' brows, being black, puts us in mind they hide the fair. He that is struck and blind cannot forget the precious treasure of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair. What doth her beauty serve but as a note where I may read who passed that passing fair? Farewell. Thou canst not teach me to forget. I'll pay that doctrine, or else die in debt. Exit. Scene two. A street. Enter Capulet, Paris, and servant. But Montague is bound as well as I, in penalty alike. It is not hard, I think, for men so old as we to keep the peace. Of honourable reckoning are you both, and pity tis you lived at odds so long. But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? But saying all what I have said before. My child is yet a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of fourteen years. Let two more summers wither in their pride. There we may think her right to be a bride. Younger than she are happy mothers made. And too soon marred are those so early made. The earth hath swallowed all my hopes but she. She is the hopeful lady of my earth. But woo her gentle Paris, get her heart. My will to her consent is but a part, And she agree, within her scope of choice lies my consent and fair according voice. This night I hold an old accustomed feast, whereto I have invited many a guest, such as I love, and you among the store, one more, most welcome makes my number more. At my poor house look to behold this night earth-treading stars that make dark heaven light, such comfort as do lusty young men feel when well-apparelled April on the heel of limping winter treads. Even such delight among fresh female buds shall you this night inherit at my house. Hear all, all see, and like her most whose merit most shall be. Which among view of many, mine, being one, may stand in number, though in reckoning none. Come, go with me. Go, Sarah, trudge about through fair Verona. Find those persons out whose names are written there gives a paper, and to them say, My house and welcome on their pleasure stay. Exit Capulet and Paris. Find them out whose names are written here. It is written that the shoemaker should meddle with his yard, and the tailor with his last, the fisher with his pencil, and the painter with his nets. But I am sent to find those persons whose names are here writ, and can never find what names the writing person hath here writ. I must to the learned in good time. Enter Benvolio and Romeo. Tut, man! One fire burns out another's burning. 
One pain is lessened by another's anguish. Turn giddy and be hope by backward turning. One desperate grief cures with another's languish. Take thou some new infection to thy eye, and the rank poison of the old will die. Your plantain leaf is excellent for that. For what, I pray thee? For your broken shin. Why, Romeo, art thou mad? Not mad, but bound more than a madman is, shut up in prison, kept without my food, whipped and tormented, and... God den, good fellow. God gear good den. I pray, sir, can you read? Ay, mine own fortune in my misery. Perhaps you have learned it without book. But, I pray, can you read anything you see? Ay, if I know the letters and the language. Ye say honestly, rest ye merry. Stay, fellow. I can read. Reads. Signor Martino and his wife and daughters. County Anselmo and his beauteous sisters. The lady widow of Vitruvio. Signor Placencio and his lovely nieces. Mercutio and his brother Valentine. My uncle Capulet, his wife and daughters, my fair niece Rosaline, Livia, Signor Valencio and his cousin Tybalt, Lucio and the lively Helena, a fair assembly. Gives back the paper. Whither should they come? Up. Whither? To supper. To our house. Whose house? My master's. Indeed. I should have asked you that before. Now I'll tell you without asking. My master is the great rich Capulet, and if you be not of the house of Montagues, I pray, come and crush a cup of wine. Rest you merry. Exit. At this same ancient feast of Capulets sups the fair Rosaline whom thou so lovest, with all the admired beauties of Verona. Go thither, and with unattainted eye compare her face with some that I shall show, and I will make thee think thy swan a crow. When the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fires. And these, who often drowned, could never die, Transparent heretics be burnt for liars. One fairer than my love, The all-seeing sun, Ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. Tut, you saw her fair, none else being by, Herself poised with herself in either eye. But in that crystal scales let there be weighed Your lady's love against some other maid, That I will show you shining at this feast, And she shall scant show well that now shows best. I'll go along, no such sight to be shown, But to rejoice in splendour of my own. Exit. Scene three. Room in Capulet's house. Enter Lady Capulet and Nurse. Nurse, where's my daughter? Call her forth to me. Now by my maidenhead, at twelve year old, I bade her come. What lamb? What ladybird? God forbid, where's this girl? What Juliet? Enter Juliet. How now? Who calls? Your mother. Madam, I am here. What is your will? This is the matter. Nurse, give leave a while, we must talk in secret. Nurse, come back again. I have remembered me. Thou's here our counsel. Thou knowest my daughter's of a pretty age. Faith, I can tell her age unto an hour. She's not fourteen. I'll lay fourteen of my teeth. And yet, to my teen it be spoken, I have but four. She is not fourteen. How long is it now to Lammas Tide? A fortnight, and odd days. Even or odd of all days in the year, come Lammas Eve at night, she shall be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age. Well, Susan is with God. She was too good for me. But as I said, on Lammas Eve at night, shall she be fourteen. That she may marry, I remember it well. Tis since the earthquake now eleven years and she was weaned. I never shall forget it, of all the days of the year upon that day, for I had then laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove-house wall. My lord and you were then at Mantua. Nay, I do bear a brain, but as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my dug, and felt it bitter, pretty fool, to see it tetchy, and fall out with the dug. Shake, quoth the dove-house, "'Twas no need, I trow, to bid me trudge. "'And since that time it is eleven years, 
for then she could stand alone. Nay, by the rood, she could have run and waddled all about. For even the day before she broke her brow, and then my husband, God be with his soul, or was a merry man, took up the child. Yea, quoth he, dost thou fall upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit, wilt thou not, Jewel? And by my holy dame, the pretty wretch left crying, and said, I, to see now how a jest shall come about, I warrant, and I should live a thousand years, I never should forget it. Wilt thou not, Jewel, quoth he, and pretty fool it stinted, and said, I, enough of this, I pray thee, hold thy peace. Yes, madam, yet I cannot choose but laugh, to think it should leave crying and say, I, and yet, I warrant, it had upon its brow a bump as big as a young cockerel stone, a perilous knock, and it cried bitterly. Yea, quoth my husband, false upon thy face, thou wilt fall backward when thou comest to age, wilt thou not, Jewel? It stinted and said, I. And stint thou too, I pray thee, nurse, say I. Peace, I have done. Thou wast the prettiest babe that e'er I nursed and I might live to see thee married once I have my wish. Marry, that marry is the very theme I came to talk of. Tell me, daughter Juliet, how stands your disposition to be married? It is an honour that I dream not of. An honour! Were not I thine only nurse, I would say thou hadst sucked wisdom from thy teat. Well, think of marriage now. Younger than you, here in Verona, ladies of esteem, are made already mothers. By my count I was your mother much upon these years that you are now a maid. Thus, then, in brief, the valiant Paris seeks you for his love. A man, young lady, lady, such a man as all the world! Why, he's a man of wax! Verona's summer hath not such a flower. Nay, he's a flower, in faith a very flower. What say you? Can you love the gentleman? This night you shall behold him at our feast. Read o'er the volume of young Paris's face, And find delight writ there with beauty's pen. Examine every married lineament, And see how one another lends content, And what obscured in this fair volume lies, Find written in the margent of his eyes, This precious book of love, this unbound lover, To beautify him only lacks a cover. The fish lives in the sea, and tis much pride For fair without the fair within to hide. That book in many's eyes doth share the glory, That in gold clasps locks in the golden story. So shall you share all that he doth possess, By having him making yourself no less. No less, nay bigger, women grow by men. Speak briefly, can you like of Paris's love? I'll look to like, if looking liking move. But no more deep will I indart mine eye Than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Enter a servant. Madam, the guests are come, supper served up. You called, my young lady asked for, the nurse cursed in the pantry, and everything in extremity. I must hence to wait. I beseech you follow straight. We follow thee. Exit servant. Juliet, the county stays. Go, girl. Seek happy nights to happy days. Exit. Scene four. A street. Enter Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio, with five or six maskers, torch-bearers, and others. What, shall this speech be spoke for our excuse, or shall we on without apology? The date is out of such prolixity. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf, bearing a tartar's painted bow of laugh, scaring the ladies like a crow-keeper, nor no without-book prologue faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance. But let them measure us by what they will. We'll measure them a measure and be gone. Give me a torch. I'm not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. Not I, believe me. You have dancing shoes with nimble soles. I have a soul of lead, so stakes me to the ground I cannot move. You are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings, and soar with them above a common bound. 
I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. Under love's heavy burden do I sink. And to sink it in, should you burden love? Too great oppression for a tender thing. Is love a tender thing? It is too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like thorn. If love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for pricking, and you beat love down. Give me a case to put my visage in. Putting on a mask. A visored for a visored. What care I what curious eye doth quote deformities? Here are the beetle brows shall blush for me. Come, knock and enter, and no sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. A torch for me, let wantons, light of heart, tickle the senseless rushes with their heels, for I am proverbed with a grandsire phrase. I'll be a candle-holder and look on. The game was ne'er so fair, and I am done. Tut, done's the mouse, the constable's own word. If thou art done, we'll draw thee from the mire of this... Sir Reverence, love, wherein thou stick'st up to the ears. Come, we burn daylight, ho. Oh. Nay, that's not so. I mean, sir, in delay we waste our lights in vain, like lamps by day. Take our good meaning, for our judgment sits five times in that, ere once in our five wits. And we mean well in going to this mask, but tis no wit to go. Why, may one ask? I dreamt a dream to-night. And so did I. Well, what was yours? That dreamers often lie. In bed asleep, while they do dream things true. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses as they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider's web, the collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film, her wagoner a small grey-coated gnat, not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel or old grub, time out of mind the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state she gallops, night by night, through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love, or courtiers' knees that dream on curtsies straight, or lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees. O'er ladies' lips, who straight on kisses dream, Which oft the angry Mab with blisters plagues, Because their breaths with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometime she gallops o'er a courtier's nose, And then dreams he of smelling out a suit, And sometimes comes she with a tithe-pig's tail, Tickling a parson's nose as he lies asleep, Then dreams he of another benefice. Sometime he driveth o'er a soldier's neck, and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of healths five fathom deep. And then, anon, drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and, being thus frightened, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is that very Mab that plats the manes of horses in the night and bakes the elf-locks in foul sluttish hairs, which, once untangled, much misfortune bodes. This is the hag, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them, and learns them first to bear, making them women of good courage. This is she. Peace, peace, Mercutio, peace. Thou talkst of nothing. True. I talk of dreams which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air, 
and more inconstant than the wind, who woos even now the frozen bosom of the north, and, being angered, puffs away from thence, turning his face to the dew-dropping south. This wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done, and we shall come too late. I fear too early, for my mind misgives some consequence, yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death but he that hath a steerage of my course direct my sail on lusty gentlemen strike drum exit scene five a hall in capulet's house Musicians waiting. Enter servants. Where's Potpan? That he helps not to take away. He shift a trencher. He scrape a trencher. When good manners shall lie all in one or two men's hands, and they unwash too, tis a foul thing. Away with the join stools. Remove the court cupboard. Look to the plate. Good thou, save me a piece of marchpane. And as thou loves me, let the porter let in Susan Grindstone and Nell. Antony and Potpan! Ay, boy, ready. You are looked for, and called for, asked for, and sought for, in the great chamber. We cannot be here, and there too. Cheerily, boys, be brisk a while, and the longer liver take all. They retire behind. Enter Capulet and company, with the guests, the maskers. Welcome, gentlemen. Ladies that have their toes unplagued with corns will have a bout with you. Ah, my mistresses! Which of you all will now deny to dance? She that makes dainty, she, I'll swear, hath corns. Am I come near you now? Welcome, gentlemen. I have seen the day that I have worn a vizard, and could tell a whispering tale in a fair lady's ear, such as would please. Mm, tis gone, tis gone, tis gone. You're welcome, gentlemen. Come, musicians, play. The whole, all, give room and foot it, girls. Music plays, and they dance. More light, you knaves, and turn the tables up. And quench the fire. The room is grown too hot. Ah, Sarah, this unlooked-for sport comes well. Nay, sit, nay, sit, good cousin Capulet. For you and I are past our dancing days. How long is now since last yourself and I were in a mask? By your lady, thirty years. What, man, tis not so much, tis not so much. Tis since the nuptial of Lucentio. Come, Pentecost, as quickly as it will, some five and twenty years, and then we masked. Tis more, tis more. His son is elder, sir. His son is thirty. Will you tell me that? His son was but a ward two years ago. What lady is that which doth enrich the hand of yonder knight? I know not, sir. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. So shows a snowy dove trooping with crows, as yonder lady o'er her fellows shows. The measure done, I'll watch her place of stand, and touching hers make blessed my rude hand. Did my heart love till now? Forswear its sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. This, by his voice, should be a Montague. Fetch me my rapier, boy. What, dares the slave come hither, covered with an antic face, to fleer and scorn at our solemnity? Now, by the stock and honour of my kin, to strike him dead I hold it not a sin. Why, how now, kinsman? Wherefore storm you so? Uncle, this is a Montague, our foe, a villain, that is hither come in spite to scorn at our solemnity this night. Young Romeo, is it? Tis he, that villain, Romeo. Content thee, gentle cars, let him alone. He bears him like a portly gentleman. 
"'And to say truth, Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well-governed youth. "'I would not for the wealth of all the town here in my house do him disparagement. "'Therefore be patient. Take no note of him. "'It is my will, the which, if thou respect, show a fair presence, and put off these frowns, "'an ill-beseeming semblance for a feast. "'It fits, when such a villain is a guest, I'll not endure him.' He shall be endured. What, good man, boy? I say he shall. Go to. Am I the master here, or you? Go to. You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. You will set cock a hoop. You'll be the man. Why, uncle, tis a shame. Go to, go to. You are a saucy boy. Is't so indeed? This trick may chance to scathe you. I know what. You must contrary me. Marry, tis time. Well said, my hearts. You are a princox. Go. Be quiet, or... More light, more light. For shame, I'll make you quiet. What? Cheerily, my hearts. Patience, perforce with willful collar meeting, makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I will withdraw. But this intrusion shall, now seeming sweet, convert to bitter gall. Exit. To Juliet. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, And palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? Ay, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh, then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. And move not while my prayer's effect I take. Thus from my lips by thine my sin is purged. Kissing her. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Sin from my lips? O oh, trespass, sweetly urged. Give me my sin again. You kiss by the book. Madam, your mother craves a word with you. What is her mother? Mary, bachelor. Her mother is the lady of the house. And a good lady and a wise and virtuous. I nursed her daughter that you talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall have the chinks. Is she a Capulet? Oh, dear account, my life is my foe's debt. Away, be gone, the sport is at the best. Aye, so I fear, for more is my unrest. Nay, gentlemen, prepare not to be gone. We have a trifling foolish banquet towards. Is Dean so? Why, then, I thank you all. I thank you, honest gentlemen. Good night. More torches here. Come on, then. Let's to bed. Ah, sirrah. To second, Capulet. By my fay, it waxes late. I'll to my rest. Exit. All but Juliet and nurse. Come hither, nurse. What is yond gentleman? The son and heir of old Tiberio. What's he that now is going out of door? Marry, that I think be young Petruchio. What's he that follows there, that would not dance? I know not. Go ask his name. If he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. His name is Romeo and Montague, the only son of your great enemy. My only love sprung from my only hate. Too early seen unknown, and known too late. Prodigious birth of love it is to me That I must love a loathed enemy. What's this? What's this? A rhyme I learned even now, Of one I danced withal. One calls within. Juliet. Anon, anon. Come, let's away. The strangers are all gone. Exit. Enter chorus. Now old desire doth in his deathbed lie, And young affection gapes to be his heir, That fair for which love groaned for and would die, With tender Juliet matched is now not fair. 
Now Romeo is beloved and loves again, alike bewitched by the charm of looks. But to his foe supposed he must complain, and she steal love's sweet bait from fearful hooks. Being held a foe he may not have excess, to breathe such vows as lovers used to swear, and she as much in love her means much less, to meet her new beloved anywhere. But passion lends them power time means to meet, tempering extremities with extreme sweet. Exit. End of Act One. Act Two of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, An Opening Place Adjoining Capulet's Garden. Enter Romeo. Can I go forward where my heart is here? Turn back, dull earth, and find thy centre out. He climbs the wall and leaps down within it. Enter Benvolio and Mercutio. Romeo! My cousin Romeo! He is wise and on my life hath stolen him to bed. He ran this way and leapt this orchard wall. Call, good Mercutio. Nay, I'll conjure too. Romeo, humours, madman, passion, lover, appear thou in the likeness of a sigh. Speak but one rhyme, and I am satisfied. Cry but, ah, me. Pronounce but love and dove. Speak to my gossip Venus one fair word, one nickname for her purblind son and heir, young Auburn Cupid, that shot so trim when King Cophetua loved the bigger maid. He heareth not, he stirreth not, he moveth not. The ape is dead, and I must conjure him. I conjure thee by Rosalie's bright eyes, by her high forehead and her scarlet lip, by her fine foot, straight leg and quivering thigh, and the dimensnes that there adjacent lie, that in thy likeness thou appear to us. And if he hear thee, thou wilt anger him. This cannot anger him. T'would anger him to raise a spirit in his mistress's circle of some strange nature, letting it there stand till she had laid it and conjured it down. That were some spite. My invocation is fair and honest, and, in his mistress's name, I conjure only but to raise up him. Come, he hath hid himself amongst these trees to be consorted with the humorous knight. Blind is his love, and best befits the dark. If love be blind, love cannot hit the mark. Now will he sit under a meddler tree, and wish his mistress were that kind of fruit as maids call meddlers when they laugh alone. Romeo, good night. I'll to my truckle bed. This field bed is too cold for me to sleep. Come, shall we go? Go then, for tis in vain to seek him here that means not to be found. Excellent. Scene two, Capulet's garden. Enter Romeo. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Juliet appears above at a window. But soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it, cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. Tis not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business to entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. 
What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. Ah, oh, me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night being o'er my head, as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white upturned wandering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lazy pacing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Aside. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth I never will be Romeo. What man art thou, that thus be screened in night, so stumblest on my counsel? By a name I know not how to tell thee who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself, because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of that tongue's utterance, yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? Neither, fair saint, if either thee dislike. How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? The orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. With love's light wings do I o'erperch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do that dares love attempt. Therefore thy kinsmen are no let to me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee. Alack, there lies more peril in thine eye than twenty of their swords. Look thou but sweet, and I am proof against their enmity. I would not for the world they saw thee here. I have knight's cloak to hide me from their sight. And but thou love me, let them find me here. My life were better ended by their hate than death prorogued wanting of thy love. By whose direction foundst thou out this place? By love, that first did prompt me to inquire. He lent me counsel, and I lent him eyes. I am no pilot. Yet wert thou as far as that vast shore washed with the furthest sea. I would adventure for such merchandise. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak to-night. Fain would I dwell on form. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell, compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest, thou mayst prove false. At lovers' perjuries they say Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou think'st I am too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo. But else, not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond. And therefore thou mayst think my haviour light, but trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess, but that thou overhurtst ere I was ware my true love passion. Therefore pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love which the dark night hath so discovered. Lady, by yonder blessed moon I swear, that tips with silver all these fruits 
tree-tops. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon that monthly changes in her circled orb, lest that thy love prove likewise variable. What shall I swear by? Do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. If my heart's dear love... Well, do not swear. Although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract to-night. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens. Sweet good-night, this bud of love by summer's ripening breath may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. Good-night, good-night, as sweet repose and rest come to thy heart as that within my breast. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? What satisfaction canst thou have to-night? The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine. I gave thee mine before thou didst request it, and yet I would it were to give again. Wouldst thou withdraw it? What purpose, love? But to be frank and give it thee again. And yet I wish but for the thing I have. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. I hear some noise within. Dear love, adieu. Nurse calls within. Anon, good nurse. Sweet Montague, be true. Stay but a little, I will come again. Exit. Oh, blessed, blessed night, I am afeard, being in night. All this is but a dream, too flattering sweet to be substantial. Enter Juliet above. Three words, dear Romeo, and good night indeed. If that thy bent of love be honourable, thy purpose marriage, send me word to-morrow by one that I'll procure to come to thee, where and what time thou wilt perform the right. And all my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay, and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. Within. Madam! I come anon. But if thou means not well, I do beseech thee. Within. Madam! By and by I come. To cease thy suit and leave me to my grief, to-morrow will I send. So thrive my soul. A thousand times good night. Exit. A thousand times the worse to want thy light. Love goes toward love as schoolboys from their books, but love from love toward school with heavy looks. Retiring slowly, re-enter Juliet above. Hist! Romeo, hist! Oh, for a falconer's voice to lure this tassel gentle back again! Bondage is hoarse and may not speak aloud, else would I tear the cave where Echo lies and make her airy tongue more hoarse than mine with repetition of my Romeo's name. It is my soul that calls upon my name. How silver sweet sound lovers' tongues by night, like softest music to attending ears. Romeo. My dear. At what o'clock to-morrow shall I send to thee? At the hour of nine. I will not fail. Tis twenty years till then. I have forgot why I did call thee back. Let me stand here till thou remember it. I shall forget to have thee still stand there, remembering how I love thy company. And I'll still stay to have thee still forget, forgetting any other home but this. Tis almost morning. I would have thee gone, and yet no farther than a wanton's bird that lets it hop a little from her hand, like a poor prisoner in his twisted jives, and with a silk thread plucks it back again, so loving jealous of his liberty. I would I were thy bird. Sweet so would I, yet I should kill thee with much cherishing. Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Exit. Sleep. Dwell upon thine eyes, peace in thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace so sweet to rest? Hence will I to my ghostly father's cell, his help to crave, and my dear hap to tell. Exit. Scene three. Friar Lawrence's cell. Enter Friar Lawrence with a basket. The green-eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light, and flecked darkness like the drunkard reels from forth day's path and tightens fiery wheels. Non, ere the sun advance his burning eye, the day to cheer and night's dank dew to dry. 
I must upfill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. The earth, that's nature's mother, is her tomb. What is her burying grave? That is her womb. And from her womb, children of divers kinds, we sucking on her natural bosom find. Many for many, virtues excellent. None but for some, and yet all different. O oh, mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For naught so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give, nor aught so good but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometimes by action dignified. Within the infant rind of this small flower, poison hath residence, and medicine power. For this, being smelt with that part, cheers each part. Being tasted, slays all senses with the heart. Two such opposing kings encamp them still, in man as well as herbs, grace and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Enter Romeo. Good morrow, father. Benedicity. What early tongue so sweet saluteth me? Young son, it argues a distempered head so soon to bid good morrow to thy bed. Care keeps his watch in every old man's eye, and where care lodges, sleep will never lie. But where unbruised youth with unstuffed brain doth couch his limbs, there golden sleep doth reign. Therefore thy earthiness doth me assure thou art uproused with some distemperature. Or, if not so, then here I hit it right. Our Romeo hath not been to bed to-night. That last is true, the sweeter rest was mine. God pardon sin. Wast thou with Rosaline? With Rosaline, my ghostly father? No, I have forgot that name and that name's woe. That's my good son. But where hast thou been, then? I'll tell thee, ere thou ask it me again. I have been feasting with mine enemy, where, on a sudden, one hath wounded me that's by me wounded. Both are remedies within thy help and holy physic lies. I bear no hatred, blessed man, for, lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. Be plain, good son, and homily in thy drift. Riddling confession finds but riddling shrift. Then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine, and all combined, save what thou must combine, by holy marriage. When, and where, and how, we met, we wooed, and made exchange of vow, I'll tell thee as we pass. But this I pray, that thou consent to marry us to-day. Holy Saint Francis! But a change is here. Is Rosalind that thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love, then, lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. Jesu Maria, what a deal of brine hath washed thy sallow cheeks for Rosaline! How much salt water thrown away in waste, to season love that doth not taste! The sun not yet thy sighs from heaven clears, the old groans ring yet in mine ancient ears. Lo! Here upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear that is not washed off yet. If e'er thou wast thyself, and these woes thine, thou and these woes were all for Rosaline. And art thou changed? Pronounce these sentences, then. Women may fall where there's no strength in men. Thou chidst me oft for loving Rosaline. For doting, not for loving, pupil mine. And bade'st me bury love. Not in a grave to lay one in, 
another out to have. I pray thee, chide not. She whom I love now doth grace for grace and love for love allow. The other did not so. Oh, she knew well. Thy love did read by rote that could not spell. But come, young waverer, come go with me. In one respect I thy assistant be. For this alliance may so happy prove to turn our household's rancour to pure love. Oh, let us hence, I stand on sudden haste. Wisely and slow. They stumble that run fast. Exit. Scene four. A street. Enter Benvolio and Mercutio. Where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home to-night? Not to his father's. I spoke with his man. Ah, that same pale, hard-hearted wench, that Rosaline, torments him so that he will sure run mad. Tybalt, the kinsman of old Capulet, hath sent a letter to his father's house. A challenge on my life. Romeo will answer it. Any man that can write may answer a letter. Nay, he will answer the letter's master how he dares being dared. Alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead. Stabbed with a white wench's black eye, shot through the ear with a love song, the very pin of his heart cleft with the blind bow boy's butt shaft. And is he a man to encounter Tybalt? Why, what is Tybalt? More than a prince of cats, I can tell you. Oh, he's the courageous captain of compliments. He fights as you sing prick song, keeps time, distance, and proportion. Rests me his minim rest, one, two, and the third in your bosom. The very butcher of a silk button, a duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the very first house, of the first and second cause. Ah, the immortal Passado, the Punto Reverso. The hay. The what? The pox of such antic, lisping, affected fantasticos. These new tuners of accents. By Jesu, a very good blade. A very tall man. A very good whore. Why, is not this a lamentable thing, grandsire, that we should be thus afflicted with these strange flies? These fashion-mongers, these pardonnez-moi's, who stand so much on the new form that they cannot sit at ease on the old bench? Oh, their bonds, their bonds! Here comes Romeo! Here comes Romeo! Without his row, like a dried herring. O oh, flesh, flesh, how art thou fishified! Now is he for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in. Laura, to his lady, was but a kitchen-wench. Mary, she had a better love to berhyme her. Dido, a dowdy. Cleopatra, a gypsy. Helen and Hero, Hildings and Harlots. Thisbe, a grey eye or so. Uh, but not to the purpose. Enter Romeo. Signor Romeo! Bonjour! There is a French salutation to your French slop. You gave us the counterfeit fairly last night. Good morrow to you both. What counterfeit did I give you? The slip, sir, the slip. Can you not conceive? Pardon, good Mercutio, my business was great, and in such a case as mine a man may strain courtesy. That's as much to say. Such a case as yours constrains a man to bow in the hams. Meaning to courtesy. Thou hast most kindly hit it. A most courteous exposition. Nay, I am the very pink of courtesy. Pink for flower. Right. Why, then, is my pump well flowered? Well said. Follow me this jest now, till thou hast worn out thy pump, that when the single soul of it is worn, the jest may remain, after the wearing, soul singular. <laughs> oh, single-souled jest, solely singular for the singleness. <laughs> Come between us, good Benvolio, my wits faint. Switz and spurs, switz and spurs, or I'll cry a match. Nay, if thy wits run the wild goose chase, I have done. For thou hast more of the wild goose in one of thy wits than, I am sure, I have in my whole five. Uh, was I with you there for the goose? 
Thou wast never with me for anything when thou wast not there for the goose. I will bite thee by the ear for that jest. Nay, good goose, bite not. Thy wit is a very bitter sweeting. It is a most sharp sauce. And is it not, then, well served into a sweet goose? Oh, here's a wit of cheveril that stretches from an inch narrow to an ell broad. I will stretch it out for that word broad, which added to the goose proves thee far and wide a broad goose. <laughs> oh, why, is this not better now than groaning for love? Now art thou sociable, now art thou Romeo, now art thou what thou art, by art as well as by nature. For this driveling love is like a great natural that runs lolling up and down to hide his bubble in a hole. Stop there, stop there. Thou desirest me to stop in my tail against the hair. Thou wouldst else have made thy tail large. Oh, thou art deceived. I would have made it short, for I was come to the whole depth of my tale, and meant, indeed, to occupy the argument no longer. Here's goodly gear. Enter Nurse and Peter. A sail, a sail, a sail! Two, two, a shirt and a smock! Peter. Anon. My fan, Peter. Good Peter, to hide her face, for her fan's the fairer face. God ye good morrow, gentlemen. God ye good den, fair gentlewoman. Is it good den? Tis no less, I tell ye, for the body hand of the dial is now upon the prick of noon. Out upon you! What a man are you! One gentlewoman that God hath made for himself to mar. By my troth, it is well said. For himself to mar, quoth he. Gentlemen, can any of you tell me where I may find the young Romeo? I can tell you. But young Romeo will be older when you have found him than he was when you sought him. I am the youngest of that name, for fault of a worse. You say well. Yea, is the worst well? Very well took, i' faith. Wisely, wisely. If you be he, sir, I desire some confidence with you. She will indict him to some supper. What hast thou found? No hair, sir. Unless a hair, sir, in a Lenten pie. That is something stale and hoar ere it be spent. Sings. An old hare whore, and an old hare whore, is very good meat in Lent. But a hare that is whore is too much for a score when it whores ere it be spent. Romeo, will you come to your father's? We'll to dinner thither. I will follow you. Farewell, ancient lady, farewell. Singing. Lady, lady, lady. Exit Mercutio and Benvolio. Marry, farewell. I pray you, sir, what saucy merchant was this that was so full of his ropery? A gentleman, nurse, that loves to hear himself talk, and will speak more in a minute than he will stand to in a month. And a speak anything against me, I'll take him down. And a will lustier than he is, and twenty such jacks. And if I cannot, I'll find those that shall. Scurvy knave. I am none of his flirt gills. I am none of his skeins, mates. And thou must stand by, too, and suffer every knave to use me at his pleasure. I saw no man use you at his pleasure. If I had, my weapon should quickly have been out, I warrant you. I dare draw as soon as another man, if I see occasion in a good quarrel. And the law is on my side. Now, afore God, I am so vexed that every part about me quivers. Scurvy knave, pray you, sir, a word. And as I told you, my young lady bid me inquire you out. What she bade me say I will keep to myself. But first let me tell ye, if ye should lead her into a fool's paradise, as they say, it were a very gross kind of behaviour, as they say, for the gentlewoman is young, and therefore if you should deal double with her, truly it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentlewoman, and very weak dealing. Nurse, commend me to thy lady and mistress, I protest unto thee. Good heart and in faith I will tell her as much. Lord, Lord, she will be a joyful woman. What wilt thou tell her, nurse? That dost not mark me. I will tell her, sir, that you do protest, which, as I take it, is a gentleman-like offer. Bid her devise some means to come to shrift this afternoon, and there she shall at Friar Lawrence's cell 
beshreved and married. Here is for thy pains. No, truly, sir, not a penny. Go to, I say you shall. This afternoon, sir. Well, she shall be there. And stay, good nurse, behind the abbey wall. Within this hour my man shall be with thee, and bring thee cords made like a tackled stair, which to the high top gallant of my joy must be my convoy in the secret night. Farewell. Be trusty, and I'll quit thy pains. Farewell. Commend me to thy mistress. Now God in heaven bless thee. Hark you, sir. What sayest thou, my dear nurse? Is your man secret? Did you ne'er hear say, two may keep counsel, putting one away? I warrant thee, my man's as true as steel. Well, sir, my mistress is the sweetest lady. Lord, Lord, when t'was a little prating thing. Oh, there's a nobleman in town, one Paris, that would fain lay knife aboard. But she, good soul, had as lief see a toad, a very toad as see him. I anger her sometimes, and tell her that Paris is the proper man. But I'll warrant you, when I say so, she looks as pale as any clout in the versal world. Doth not Rosemary and Romeo both begin with a letter? Ay, nurse, what of that? Both with an R. Ah, mocker! What's the dog's name? R is for the dog. No, I know it begins with some other letter. And she hath the prettiest sententious of it, of you and Rosemary, that it would do you good to hear it. Commend me to thy lady. Aye, a thousand times. Exit Romeo. Peter. Anon. Peter, take my fan, and go before. Exit. Scene five. Capulet's garden. Enter Juliet. The clock struck nine when I did send the nurse. In half an hour she promised to return. Perchance she cannot meet him. Oh, that's not so. Oh, she is lame. Love's herald should be thoughts, which ten times faster glide than the sun's beams, driving back shadows over lowering hills. Therefore do nimble pinion doves draw love, and therefore hath the wind-swift Cupid's wings. Now is the sun upon the highmost hill of this day's journey, and from nine till twelve is three long hours, yet she is not come. Had she affections and warm youthful blood, she'd be as swift in motion as a ball. My words would bandy her to my sweet love and his to me. But old folks, many fain as they were dead, unwieldy, slow, heavy, and pale as lead. Oh, God, she comes! Enter Nurse and Peter. Oh, honey, Nurse, what news? Hast thou met with him? Send thy man away. Peter, stay at the gate. Exit Peter. Now, good, sweet nurse. O oh, Lord, why look'st thou sad? Though news be sad, yet tell them merrily. If good, thou shamest the music of sweet news by playing it to me with so sour a face. I am a weary. Give me leave a while. Fie, how my bones ache! What a jaunt have I had! I would thou hadst my bones, and I thy news. Nay, come, I pray thee, speak, good, good nurse, speak. Jesu, what haste! Can you not stay a while? Do you not see that I am out of breath? How art thou out of breath, when thou hast breath to say to me that thou art out of breath? The excuse that thou dost make in this delay is longer than the tale thou dost excuse. Is thy news good or bad? Answer to that. Say either, and I'll stay the circumstance. Let me be satisfied, is't good or bad? Well, you have made a simple choice. You know not how to choose a man. Romeo. No, not he. Though his face be better than any man's, yet his leg excels all men's. And for a hand, and a foot, and a body, though they be not to be talked on, yet they are past compare. He is not the flower of courtesy, but I'll warrant him as gentle as a lamb. Go thy ways, wench, serve God. What, have you dined at home? No, no, but all this did I know before. What says he of our marriage? What of that? Lord, how my head aches! What a head have I! It beats as if it would fall in twenty pieces. My back at the other side, oh, my back, my back! Beshrew your heart for sending me about to catch my death with jouncing up and down. If faith, I am sorry that thou art not well. Sweet, sweet, sweet nurse, tell me, what says my love? Your love says, 
like an honest gentleman, and a courteous and a kind and a handsome, and I warrant a virtuous. Where is your mother? Where is my mother? Why, she is within. Where should she be? How oddly thou repliest, your love says like an honest gentleman, where is your mother? Oh, God's lady dear, are you so hot? Mary, come up, I trow. Is this the poultice for my aching bones? Henceforward do your messages yourself. Here's such a coil. Come, what says Romeo? Have you got leave to go to shrift to-day? I have. Then hie you hence to Friar Lawrence's cell. There stays a husband to make you a wife. Now comes the wanton blood up in your cheeks. They'll be in scarlet straight at any news. Hie you to church. I must another way to fetch a ladder, by the which your love must climb a bird's nest soon when it is dark. I am the drudge, and toil in your delight. But you shall bear the burden soon at night. Go, I'll to dinner, hie you to the cell. Oh, hie to high fortune, honest nurse, farewell. Exit. Scene six. Friar Lawrence's cell. Enter Friar Lawrence and Romeo. So smile the heavens upon this holy act, That after hours would sorrow chide us not. Amen, amen. But come, what sorrow can, it cannot countervail The exchange of joy that one short minute gives me in her sight. Do thou but close our hands with holy words, Then love-devouring death do what he dare. It is enough I may but call her mine. These violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die, like fire and powder, which, as they kiss, consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in his own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore love moderately, long love doth so. Too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. Here comes the lady. Oh, so light a foot will ne'er wear out the everlasting flint. A lover may bestride the gossamer that idles in the wanton summer air, and yet not fall. So light is vanity. Enter Juliet. Good even to my ghostly confessor. Romeo shall thank thee, daughter, for us both. As much to him else is his thanks too much. Ah, Juliet, if the measure of thy joy be heaped like mine, and that thy skill be more to blazon it, then sweeten with thy breath this neighbour air, and let rich music's tongue unfold the imagined happiness that both receive in either by this dear encounter. Conceit, more rich in matter than in words, brags of his substance, not of ornament. They are but beggars that can count their worth. But my true love is grown to such excess, I cannot sum up some of half my wealth. Come, come with me, and we will make short work. For by your leaves you shall not stay alone till holy church incorporate two in one. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One A Public Place. Enter Mercutio, Benvolio, Page, and Servants. I pray thee, good Mercutio, let's retire. The day is hot, the Capulets abroad, and if we meet, we shall not scape a brawl. For now, these hot days is the mad blood stirring. Thou art like one of these fellows that, when he enters the confines of a tavern, clasps me his sword upon the table, and says, God send me no need of thee, and, by the operation of the second cup, draws him on the drawer, when indeed there is no need. Am I like such a fellow? Come, come. Thou art as hot a jack in thy mood as any in Italy, and as soon moved to be moody, and as soon moody to be moved. And what two? Nay, and there were two such, 
we should have none shortly, for one would kill the other. Thou! Why, thou wilt quarrel with a man that hath a hair more or a hair less in his beard than thou hast. Thou wilt quarrel with a man for cracking nuts, having no other reason but because thou hast hazel eyes. What eye but such an eye would spy out such a quarrel? Thy head is as full of quarrels as an egg is full of meat, and yet thy head hath been beaten as addle as an egg for quarrelling. Thou hast quarrelled with a man for coughing in the street, because he hath wakened thy dog that hath lain asleep in the sun. Didst thou not fall out with a tailor for wearing his new doublet before Easter? With another for tying his new shoes with an old ribbon? And yet thou wilt tutor me from quarrelling. And I were apt to quarrel as thou art, any man should buy the fee sample of my life for an hour and a quarter. The fee simple. Oh, simple. By my head, here come the Capulets. By my heel, I care not. Enter Tybalt and others. Follow me close, for I will speak to them. Gentlemen, good den. A word with one of you. And but one word with one of us? Couple it with something. Make it a word and a blow. You shall find me apt enough to do that, sir, and you will give me occasion. Could you not take some occasion without giving? Mercutio, thou consortest with Romeo. Consort? What, dost thou make us minstrels? And thou make minstrels of us look to hear nothing but discords. Here's my fiddlestick. Here's that shall make you dance. Zounds, consort! We talk here in the public haunt of men, either withdraw unto some private place, and reason coldly of your grievances, or else depart. Here all eyes gaze on us. Men's eyes were made to look, and let them gaze. I will not budge for no man's pleasure, I. Well, peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. Enter Romeo. But I'll be hanged, sir, if he wear your livery. Marry, go before to the field. He'll be your follower. Your worship, in that sense, may call him man. Romeo, the love I bear thee can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain! Tybalt, the reason that I have to love thee doth much excuse the appertaining rage to such a greeting. Villain am I none. Therefore farewell, I see thou know'st me not. Boy, this shall not excuse the injuries that thou hast done me. Therefore turn and draw. I do protest I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise till thou shalt know the reason of my love. And so, good Capulet, which name I tender as dearly as mine own, be satisfied. Oh, calm, dishonourable, vile submission. Alla Stoccata carries it away. Draws. Tybalt, you rat-chaser, will you walk? What wouldst thou have with me? Good king of cats, nothing but one of your nine lives. That I mean to make bold withal, and, as you shall use me hereafter, dry-beat the rest of the eight. Will you pluck your sword out of his pitcher by the ears? Make haste, lest mine be about your ears ere it be out. I am for you. Drawing. Gentle Mercutio, put thy rapier up. Come, sir, your passado. They fight. Draw, Benvolio, beat down their weapons. Gentlemen, for shame, forbear this outrage. Tybalt, Mercutio, the prince expressly hath forbid this bandying in Verona street. Hold, Tybalt! Good Mercutio! Exit Tybalt with his partisans. Ah! Uh, uh. <laughs> I am hurt. Uh, a plague on both your houses. Uh, I am sped. Is he gone, and hath nothing? What, art thou hurt? Aye, uh, aye, a scratch, a scratch. Mary, tis enough. Where is my page? Go, villain, fetch a surgeon. Exit page. Courage, man. The herd cannot be much. No, tis not so deep as a well, 
nor so wide as a church door but tis enough twill serve ask for me to-morrow and you shall find me a grave man <laughs> I am peppered, I warrant, for this world. A plague of both your houses. Zounds, a dog, a rat, a mouse, a cat to scratch a man to death. A braggart, a rogue, a villain, that fights by the book of arithmetic. Why the devil came you between us? I was hurt under your arm. I thought all for the best. Help me into some house, Benvolio, or I shall faint. A plague on both your houses! They have made worms meat of me. I have it, and soundly, too. Your houses! Exit Mercutio and Benvolio. This gentleman... The prince's near ally, my very friend, hath got his mortal hurt in my behalf, my reputation stained with Tybalt's slander. Tybalt, that an hour hath been my kinsman. O oh, sweet Juliet, my beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper softened valor's steel. Re-enter Benvolio. O oh, Romeo, Romeo, brave Mercutio's dead! That gallant spirit hath aspired the clouds which too untimely here did scorn the earth. This day's black fate on more days doth depend. This but begins the woe others must end. Here comes the furious Tybalt back again. Alive in triumph, and Mercutio slain. Away to heaven, respective lenity, and fire-eyed fury be my conduct now. Re-enter Tybalt. Now, Tybalt, take the villain back again that late thou gavest me. For Mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads, staying for thine to keep him company. Either thou, or I, or both, must go with him. Thou, wretched boy, that didst consort him here, shalt with him hence. This shall determine that. They fight. Tybalt falls. Romeo, away, be gone. The citizens are up and Tybalt slain. Stand not amazed. The prince will doom thee death if thou art taken. Hence, be gone, away. Oh, I am fortune's fool. Why dost thou stay? Exit Romeo. Enter citizens and company. Which way ran he that killed Mercutio? Tybalt, that murderer, which way ran he? There lies that Tybalt. Up, sir, go with me. I charge thee in the prince's name, obey. Enter prince, attended. Montague, Capulet, their wives, and others. Where are the vile beginners of this fray? O noble prince, I can discover all the unlucky manage of this fatal brawl. There lies the man, slain by young Romeo, that slew thy kinsman, brave Mercutio. Tybalt, my cousin, O oh, my brother's child. O oh, prince, O oh, husband, O oh, the blood is spilled of my dear kinsman. Prince, as thou art true, for blood of ours, shed blood of Montague. O oh, cousin, cousin. Benvolio, who began this bloody fray? Tybalt, here slain, whom Romeo's hand did slay. Romeo that spoke him fair, bade him bethink how nice the quarrel was, and urged with all your high displeasure. All this uttered with gentle breath, calm look, knees humbly bowed, could not take truce with the unruly spleen of Tybalt, deaf to peace. But he that tilts with piercing steel at bold Mercutio's breast, who all as hot turns deadly point to point, and with a martial scorn, one hand beats cold death aside, and with the other sends it back to Tybalt, whose dexterity retorts it. Romeo, he cries aloud, hold, hold, friends, part, and swifter than his tongue, his agile arm beats down their fatal points, and twixt them rushes, underneath whose arm an envious thrust from Tybalt hit the life of stout Mercutio, and then Tybalt fled, but by and by comes back to Romeo, who had but newly entertained revenge, and to it they go like lightning, 
for ere I could draw to part them was stout Tybalt slain, and as he fell did Romeo turn and fly. This is the truth, or let Benvolio die. He is a kinsman to the Montague. Affection makes him false, he speaks not true. Some twenty of them fought in this black strife, and all those twenty could but kill one life. I beg for justice, which thou, prince, must give. Romeo slew Tybalt. Romeo must not live. Romeo slew him. He slew Mercutio, who now the price of his dear blood doth owe. Not Romeo, prince. He was Mercutio's friend. His fault concludes but what the law should end, the life of Tybalt. And for that offence, immediately we do exile him hence. I have an interest in your hate's proceeding. My blood for your rude brawls doth lie a-bleeding. But I'll immerse you with so strong a fine that you shall all repent the loss of mine. I will be deaf to pleading and excuses. No tears nor prayers shall purchase out abuses. Therefore use none. Let Romeo hence in haste, else where he is found, that hour is his last. Bear hence this body, and attend our will. Mercy but murders, pardoning those that kill. Exit. Scene two. A room in Capulet's house. Enter Juliet. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, towards Phoebus' lodging. Such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Spread thy close curtain, love performing night, that rude eyes may wink, and Romeo leap to these arms untalked of and unseen. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauties, or if love be blind it best agrees with night. Come, civil night, thou sober-suited matron all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. Hood my unmanned blood, baiting in my cheeks with thy black mantle, till strange love, grown bold, think true love acted simple modesty. Come, night, come, Romeo, come, thou day in night, for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than new snow upon a raven's back. Come, gentle night, come, loving, black-browed night, give me my Romeo, and when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night, and pay no worship to the garish sun. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it, and though I am sold, not yet enjoyed, so tedious is this day as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. Oh, here comes my nurse, and she brings news, and every tongue that speaks but Romeo's name speaks heavenly eloquence. Enter nurse with cords. Now, nurse, what news? What hast thou there? The cords that Romeo bid thee fetch? Ay, ay, the cords. Throws them down. Ah, me! What news? Why dost thou wring thy hands? Ah, well a day! He's dead, he's dead, he's dead! We are undone, lady, we are undone! Alack the day! He's gone, he's killed, he's dead! Can heaven be so envious? Romeo can, though heaven cannot. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, who would ever have thought it? Romeo! What devil art thou that dost torment me thus? This torture should be roared in dismal hell. Hath Romeo slain himself? Say thou but I, and that bare vowel I shall poison more than the death-darting eye of cockatrice. I am not I, if there be such an eye, or those eyes shut that make thee answer I. If he be slain, say I, or if not, no. Brief sounds determine of my weal or woe. I saw the wound, I saw it with mine eyes. God save the mark, here, on his manly breast. A piteous course, a bloody piteous course. Pale, 
pale as ashes, all bedaubed in blood, all in gore blood. I swooned at the sight. Oh, break my heart, poor Bancroft, break at once, to prison eyes ne'er look on liberty. Vile earth, to earth resign, end motion here, and thou and Romeo press one heavy beer. Oh, Tybalt, Tybalt, the best friend I had. Oh, courteous Tybalt, honest gentleman, that ever I should live to see thee dead. What storm is this that blows so contrary? Is Romeo slaughtered and is Tybalt dead? My dear loved cousin and my dearer lord? Then dreadful trumpet sound the general doom, for who is living if those two are gone? Tybalt is gone, and Romeo banished. Romeo that killed him, he is banished. Oh, God! Did Romeo's hand shed Tybalt's blood? It did! It did! Alas, the day it did! Oh, serpent heart hid with a flowering face! Did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolvish ravening lamb, despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seem'st, a damned saint and honourable villain. O oh, nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? Was ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace! There's no trust, no faith, no honesty in men, all perjured, all forsworn, all not, all dissemblers. Ah, where is my man? Give me some aquavitae. These griefs, these woes, these sorrows make me old. Shame come to Romeo. Blistered be thy tongue for such a wish. He was not born to shame. Upon his brow shame is a shame to sit, for tis a throne where honour may be crowned, sole monarch of the universal earth. Oh, what a beast was I to chide at him! Will you speak well of him that killed your cousin? Shall I speak ill of him that is my husband? Ah, oh, poor my lord, what tongue shall smooth thy name when I, thy three hours' wife, have mangled it? But wherefore, villain, didst thou kill my cousin? That villain cousin would have killed my husband. Back, foolish tears, back to your native spring. Your tributary drops belong to woe, which you mistaking offer up to joy. My husband lives that Tybalt would have slain, and Tybalt's dead that would have slain my husband. All this is comfort. Wherefore weep I, then? Some word there was, worser than Tybalt's death, that murdered me. I would forget it fain. But, oh, it presses to my memory like damned guilty deeds to sinners' minds. Tybalt is dead, and Romeo banished. That banished, that one word banished, hath slain ten thousand Tybalts. Tybalt's death was woe enough if it had ended there or if sour woe delights in fellowship, and needly will be ranked with other griefs. Why followed not when she said Tybalt's dead, thy father or thy mother, nay, or both, which modern lamentation might have moved? But with a rearward following Tybalt's death, Romeo is banished. To speak that word is father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all slain, all dead. Romeo is banished. There is no end. No limit, measure, bound in that word's death. No words can that woe sound. Where is my father and mother, nurse? Weeping and wailing over Tybalt's course. Will you go to them? I will bring you thither. Wash they his wounds with tears. Mine shall be spent when theirs are dry for Romeo's banishment. Take up those cords. Poor ropes, you are beguiled, both you and I, for Romeo is exiled. He made you for a highway to my bed, but I, a maid, die maiden widowed. Come, courts, come, nurse, I'll to my wedding bed, and death not, Romeo, take my maiden head. Hide to your chamber. I'll find Romeo to comfort you. I wot well where he is. Hark ye, your Romeo will be here at night. I'll to him. He is hid at Lawrence's cell. Oh, find him! 
Give this ring to my true knight, and bid him come to take his last farewell. Exit. Scene three. Friar Lawrence's cell. Enter Friar Lawrence. Romeo, come forth. Come forth, thou fearful man. Affliction is enamoured of thy parts, and thou art wedded to calamity. Enter Romeo. Father, what news? What is the prince's doom? What sorrow craves acquaintance at my hand that I yet know not? Too familiar is my dear son with such sour company. I bring thee tidings of the prince's doom. What less than doomsday is the prince's doom? A gentler judgment vanished from his lips. Not body's death, but body's banishment. Ha! <laughs> banishment? Be merciful, say death. For exile hath more terror in his look, much more than death. Do not say banishment. Hence, from Verona art thou banished. Be patient, for the world is broad and wide. There is no world without Verona's walls, but purgatory, torture, hell itself. Hence banished is banished from the world, and world's exile is death. Then banished is death mistermed, calling death banishment thou cutst my head off with a golden axe and smilest upon the stroke that murders me o deadly sin o rude unthankfulness thy fault our law calls death but the kind prince taking thy part hath brushed aside the law and turned that black word death to banishment this is dear mercy and thou seest it not "'Tis torture and not mercy. "'Heaven is here where Juliet lives, "'and every cat and dog and little mouse, "'every unworthy thing, live here in heaven "'and may look on her, but Romeo may not. "'More validity, more honourable state, "'more courtship lives in carrion flies than Romeo. "'They may seize on the white wonder of dear Juliet's hand "'and steal immortal blessing from her lips, "'who, even in pure and vestal modesty, "'still blush as thinking their own kisses sin. "'But Romeo may not. "'He is banished. "'This may flies do when I from this must fly, and sayest thou yet that exile is not death? <sighs> Hadst thou no poison mixed, no sharp ground knife, no sudden mean of death, though ne'er so mean, but banished to kill me? Banished! <sighs> oh, friar, the damned use that word in hell. Howlings attended. How hast thou the heart, being a divine, a ghostly confessor, a sin absolver, and my friend professed, to mangle me with that word banishment? Thou fond madman, hear me speak a little. Oh, thou wilt speak again of banishment. I'll give thee armour to keep off that word. Adversity's sweet milk, philosophy, to comfort thee though thou art banished. Yet banished? Hanged up philosophy! Unless philosophy can make a Juliet, displant a town, reverse a prince's doom, it helps not, it prevails not, talk no more. Oh, then, I see that madmen have no ears. How should they, when that wise men have no eyes? Let me dispute with thee of thy estate. Thou canst not speak of that thou dost not feel. Wert thou as young as I, Juliet thy love, an hour but married, a tippled a murder, doting like me, and like me banished, then mightst thou speak, then mightst thou tear thy hair and fall upon the ground as I do now, taking the measure of an unmade grave. Knocking within. Arise, one knocks. Good Romeo, hide thyself. Not I unless the breath of heart-sick groans mist-like enfold me from the search of eyes. Hark! How they knock! Who's there? Romeo, arise. Thou wilt be taken. Stay a while. Stand up. Run to my study. By and by God's will. What simpleness this is! I come! I come! Who knocks so hard? Whence come you? 
What's your will? Within. Let me come in and you shall know my errand. I come from Lady Juliet. Welcome, then. Enter nurse. O oh, holy friar, O oh, tell me, holy friar, where is my lady's lord? Where's Romeo? There on the ground, with his own tears made drunk. Oh, he is even in my mistress's case, just in her case. Oh, woeful sympathy, piteous predicament. Even so lies she, blubbering and weeping, weeping and blubbering. Stand up, stand up, stand, and you be a man. For Juliet's sake, for her sake, rise and stand. Why should you fall into so deep an O? Nurse. Ah, sir, well, death's the end of all. Spakest thou of Juliet? How is it with her? Dost not she think me an old murderer, now I have stained the childhood of our joy with blood removed but little from her own? Where is she, and how doth she? And what says my concealed lady to our cancelled love? Oh, she says nothing, sir, but weeps and weeps, and now falls on her bed, and then starts up, and Tybalt calls, and then on Romeo cries, and then down falls again. As if that name, shot from the deadly level of a gun, did murder her, as that name's cursed hand murdered her kinsman. Oh, tell me, friar, tell me, in what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? Tell me, that I may sack the hateful mansion. Drawing his sword. Hold thy desperate hand. Art thou a man? Thy form cries out thou art. Thy tears are womanish. Thy acts denote the unreasonable fury of a beast. Unseemingly woman in a seeming man. Or ill-beseeming beast in seeming both. Thou hast amazed me. By my holy order I thought thy disposition better tempered. Hast thou slain Tybalt? Wilt thou slay thyself, and slay thy lady too, that lives in thee, by doing damned hate upon thyself? Why railest thou on thy birth, the heaven, the earth? Since birth and heaven and earth, all three do meet in thee at once, which thou at once, which thou at once wouldst love. Fie! Fie! Thou shamest thy shape, thy love, thy wit, which, like a usurer, aboundest in all, and usest none in that true use indeed which should bedeck thy shape, thy love, thy wit. Thy noble shape is but a form of wax, digressing from the valour of a man, thy dear love sworn but hollow perjury, killing that love which thou hast vowed to cherish. Thy wit, that ornament to shape and love, misshapen in the conduct of them both, like powder in a skillless soldier's flask is set afire by thine own ignorance, and thou dismembered with thine own defence. What? Rouse thee, man! Thy Juliet is alive, for whose dear sake thou wast but lately dead. There art thou happy. Tybalt would kill thee, but thou slewest Tybalt. There art thou happy too. The law that threatened death becomes thy friend, and turns it to exile. There art thou happy. A pack of blessings lights upon thy back. Happiness courts thee in her best array. But, like a misbehaven and sullen wench, thou poutest upon the future and thy love. Take heed, take heed, for such die miserable. Go, get thee to thy love as was decreed. Ascend her chamber hence, and comfort her. But look, thou stay not, till the watch be set, for then thou canst not pass to Mantua, where you shalt live till we can find a time to blaze your marriage, reconcile your friends, beg pardon of the prince, and call thee back with twenty hundred thousand times more joy than thou wentst forth in lamentation. Go before, nurse, 
commend me to thy lady, and bid her hasten all the house to bed, which heavy sorrow makes them apt unto. Romeo is coming. Oh, Lord, I could have stayed here all the night to hear good counsel. Oh, what learning is! My lord, I'll tell my lady you will come. Do so, and bid my sweet prepare to chide. Here, sir, a ring she bid me give you, sir. Hi, you, make haste, for it grows very late. Exit. How well my comfort is revived by this. Go hence, good night. And here stands all your state. Either be gone before the watch is set, or by the break of day disguised from hence, sojourn in Mantua. I'll find out your man, and he shall signify from time to time every good hap to you that chances here. Give me your hand. Tis late. Farewell. Good night. But that a joy past joy calls out on me, it were a grief so brief to part with thee. Farewell. Exit. Scene four. A room in Capulet's house. Enter Capulet, Lady Capulet, and Paris. Things have fallen out, sir, so unluckily that we have had no time to move our daughter. Look you, she loved her kinsman Tybalt dearly, and so did I. Well, we were born to die. Tis very late. She'll not come down to-night. I promise you, but for your company, I would have been in bed an hour ago. These times of woe afford no tune to woo. Madam, good night. Commend me to your daughter. I will, and know her mind early to-morrow. To-night she's mewed up to her heaviness. Sir Paris, I will make a desperate tender of my child's love. I think she will be ruled in all respects by me. Nay, more, I doubt it not. Wife, go you to her ere you go to bed. Acquaint her here of my son Paris's love, and bid her, mark you me, on Wednesday next. But soft, what day is this? Monday, my lord. Monday. Ah, well, Wednesday is too soon. Thursday let it be. A Thursday, tell her. She shall be married to this noble earl. Will you be ready? Do you like this haste? We'll keep no great ado, a friend or two. For, hark you, Tybalt being slain so late, it may be thought we held him carelessly, being our kinsman, if we revel much. Therefore we'll have some half a dozen friends, and there an end. But what say you to Thursday? My lord, I would that Thursday were to-morrow. Well, get you gone. A Thursday be it, then. Go you to Juliet ere you go to bed. Prepare her wife against this wedding day. Farewell, my lord. Light to my chamber, ho! Before me, it is so very, very late that we may call it early by and by. Good night. Exit. Scene five. An open gallery to Juliet's chamber, overlooking the garden. Enter Romeo and Juliet. Wilt thou be gone? It is not yet near day. It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Nightly she sings on yon pomegranate tree. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. It was the lark, the herald of the morn, no nightingale. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severing clouds in yonder east. Night's candles are burnt out and jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain-tops. I must be gone and live, or stay and die. Yond light is not daylight, I know it, I. It is some meteor that the sun exhales to be to thee this night a torch-bearer, and light thee on the way to Mantua. Therefore stay yet, thou needst not to be gone. Let me be ta'en, let me be put to death. I am content, so thou wilt have it so. I'll say yon grey is not the morning's eye, tis but the pale reflex of Cynthia's brow, nor that is not the lark whose notes do beat the faulty heavens so high above our heads. I have more care to stay than will to go. Come, death, and welcome. Juliet wills it so. How is my soul? 
Let's talk. It is not day. It is. It is. Hi, hence, be gone, away. It is the lark that sings so out of tune, straining harsh discords and unpleasing sharps. Some say the lark makes sweet division. This doth not so, for she divideth us. Some say the lark and loathed toad change eyes. Oh, now I would they had changed voices, too, since arm from arm that voice doth us affray, hunting thee hence with hunts up to the day. Oh, now be gone, more light and light it grows. More light and light, more dark and dark our woes. Enter Nurse. Madam! Nurse, your lady mother is coming to your chamber. The day is broke. Be wary. Look about. Exit. Then window let day in and let life out. Farewell, farewell. One kiss and I'll descend. Descends. Art thou gone so? My lord, my love, my friend, I must hear from thee every day of the hour, for in a minute there are many days. Oh, by this count I shall be much in years ere I again behold my Romeo. Farewell. I will omit no opportunity that may convey my greetings, love, to thee. Oh, think'st thou we shall ever meet again? I doubt it not, and all these woes shall serve for sweet discourses in our time to come. Oh, God, I have an ill-divining soul. Methinks I see thee now thou art below, as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou look'st pale. And trust me, love, in my eyes so do you. Dry sorrow drinks our blood. Adieu. Adieu. Exit below. Oh, fortune, fortune, all men call thee fickle. If thou art fickle, what dost thou with him that is renowned for faith? Be fickle, fortune, for then I hope thou wilt not keep him long, but send him back. Within. Oh, daughter, are you up? Who is that calls? Is it my lady mother? Is she not down so late or up so early? What unaccustomed cause procures her hither? Enter Lady Capulet. Why, how now, Juliet? Madam, I am not well. Evermore weeping for your cousin's death. What? Wilt thou wash him from his grave with tears? And if thou couldst, thou couldst not make him live. Therefore have done. Some grief shows much of love, but much of grief shows still some want of wit. Yet let me weep for such a feeling loss. So shall you feel the loss, but not the friend which you weep for. Feeling so the loss, I cannot choose but ever weep the friend. Well, girl, thou weepst not so much for his death, as that the villain lives which slaughtered him. What villain, madam? That same villain, Romeo. Villain and he be many miles asunder. God pardon him, I do, with all my heart, and yet no man like he doth grieve my heart. That is because the traitor murderer lives. I, madam, from the reach of these my hands, would none but I might venge my cousin's death. We will have vengeance for it, fear thou not. Then weep no more. I'll send to one in Mantua, where that same banished runagate doth live. Shall give him such an unaccustomed dram, that he shall soon keep Tybalt company. And then, I hope, thou wilt be satisfied. Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him. Dead. Is my poor heart so for a kinsman vexed? Madam, if you could find out but a man to bear a poison, I would temper it, that Romeo should, upon receipt thereof, soon sleep in quiet. Oh, how my heart abhors to hear him named, and cannot come to him! to wreck the love I bore my cousin Tybalt upon his body that hath slaughtered him. Find thou the means, and I'll find such a man. But now I'll tell thee joyful tidings, girl. And joy comes well in such a needy time. What are they, I beseech your ladyship? Well, well, thou hast a careful father, child, one who, to put thee from thy heaviness, hath sorted out a sudden day of joy, that thou expectest not, nor I looked out for. Madam, in happy time, what day is that? Marry, my child, early next Thursday morn. The gallant, young and noble gentleman, the county Paris at St. Peter's Church, shall happily make thee there a joyful bride. 
Now by St. Peter's church, and Peter too, he shall not make me there a joyful bride. I wonder at this haste, that I must wed ere he that should be husband comes to woo. I pray you tell my lord and father, madam, I will not marry yet, and when I do I swear it shall be Romeo, whom you know I hate, rather than Paris. These are news indeed. Here comes your father. Tell him so yourself, and see how he will take it at your hands. Enter Capulet and Nurse. When the sun sets, the air doth drizzle dew, but for the sunset of my brother's sun it rains downright. How now, a candid girl, what's still in tears? Evermore showering? In one little body thou counterfeit'st a bark, a sea, a wind. For still thy eyes, which I may call the sea, do ebb and flow with tears. The bark thy body is, sailing in this salt flood, the winds thy sighs, who, raging with thy tears, and they with them, without a sudden calm, will overset thy tempest-tossed body. How now, wife, have you delivered to her our decree? Ay, sir, but she will none, she gives you thanks. I would the fool were married to her grave. Soft, take me with you, take me with you, wife, how? Will she none? Doth she not give us thanks? Is she not proud? Doth she not count her blessed, unworthy as she is, that we have wrought so worthy a gentleman to be her bridegroom? Not proud you have, but thankful that you have. Proud can I never be of what I hate, but thankful even for hate that is meant love. How now, how now, chop logic? What is this? Proud, and I thank you, and I thank you not, and yet not proud, mistress minion. You thank me no thankings, nor proud me no prouds, but fettle your fine joints gainst Thursday next, to go with Paris to St. Peter's Church, or I will drag thee on a hurdle thither. Out, you green sickness carrion, out, you baggage, you tallow face. Fie, fie, what are you, mad? Good father, I beseech you on my knees, hear me with patience but to speak a word. Hang thee, young baggage, disobedient wretch. I tell thee what, get thee to church a Thursday, or never after look me in the face. Speak not, reply not, do not answer me. My fingers itch. Wife, we scarce thought us blessed that God had lent us but this only child. But now I see this one is one too much, and that we have a curse in having her. Out on her, hilting. God in heaven bless her. You are to blame, my lord, to rate her so. And why, my lady wisdom, hold your tongue? Good prudence, smatter with your gossips, go. I speak no treason. Oh, God ye good. May not one speak? Peace, you mumbling fool, utter your gravity or a gossip's bowl, for here we need it not. You are too hot. God's bread, it makes me mad. Day, night, hour, time, tide, work, play, alone, in company, still my care hath been to have her matched. And having now provided a gentleman of noble parentage, of fair demeans, youthful, and nobly trained, stuffed, as they say, with honourable parts, proportion, as one's heart would wish a man. And then to have a wretched, puling fool, a whining mammoth in her fortunes tender, to answer, I'll not wed, I cannot love, I am too young, I pray you pardon me. But, and you will not wed, I'll pardon you. Graze where you will, you shall not house with me. Look to it, think on it, I do not use to jest. Thursday is near, lay hand on heart, advise, and you be mine. I'll give you to my friend, and you be not hang, beg, starve, die of the streets, for by my soul I'll ne'er acknowledge thee, nor what is mine shall never do thee good. Trust to it, bethink you, I'll not be forsworn. Exit. Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week, or if you do not, make the bridal bed in that dim monument where Tybalt lies. Talk not to me, for I'll not speak a word. Do as thou wilt, for I have done with thee. Exit. Oh, God! Oh, nurse! How shall this be prevented? My husband is on earth, my faith in heaven. How shall that faith return again to earth, unless that husband send it me from heaven by leaving earth? Comfort me, counsel me. 
alack, alack, that heaven should practice stratagems upon so soft a subject as myself. What sayest thou? Hast thou not a word of joy? Some comfort, nurse? Faith, here tis. Romeo is banished, and all the world to nothing, that he dares ne'er come back to challenge you. Or if he do, it needs must be by stealth. Then, since the case so stands as now it doth, I think it best you married with the county. Oh, he is a lovely gentleman. Romeo's a dish-clout to him. An eagle, madam, hath not so green, so quick, so fair an eye as Paris hath. Beshrew my very heart, I think you are happy in this second match, for it excels your first. Or, if it did not, your first is dead. Or t'were as good he were as living here, and you no use of him. Speaks thou this from thy heart? And from my soul, too, or else beshrew them both. Amen. What? Well, thou hast comforted me marvellous much. Go in, and tell my lady I am gone, having displeased my father to Lawrence's cell, to make confession and to be absolved. Marry, I will, and this is wisely done. Exit. Ancient damnation! O oh, most wicked fiend! Is it more sin to wish me thus forsworn, or to dispraise my lord with that same tongue which she hath praised him with above compare so many thousand times? Go, counsellor, thou and my bosom henceforth shall be twain. I'll to the friar to know his remedy. If all else fail, myself have power to die. Exit. End of Act Three Act Four of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One Friar Lawrence's Cell. Enter Friar Lawrence and Paris. On Thursday, sir, the time is very short. My father Capulet will have it so, and I am nothing slow to slack his haste. You say you do not know the lady's mind? Uneven is the course. I like it not. Immoderately she weeps for Tybalt's death, and therefore have I little talked of love, for <laughs> Venus smiles not in a house of tears. Now, sir, her father counts it dangerous that she do give her sorrow so much sway, and, in his wisdom, hastes our marriage to stop the inundation of her tears, which, too much minded by herself alone, may be put from her by society. Now do you know the reason of this haste? Aside. I would I knew not why it should be slowed. Look, sir. Here comes the lady towards my cell. Enter Juliet. Happily met, my lady and my wife. That may be, sir, when I may be a wife. That may must be, love, on Thursday next. What must be shall be. That's a certain text. Come you to make a confession to this father? To answer that I should confess to you. Do not deny to him that you love me. I will confess to you that I love him. So will ye, I am sure, that you love me. If I do so, it will be of more price being spoke behind your back than to your face. Poor soul, thy face is much abused with tears. The tears have got small victory by that, for it was bad enough before their spite. Thou wrongst it more than tears with that report. That is no slander, sir, which is a truth, and what I spake, I spake it to my face. Thy face is mine, and thou hast slandered it. It may be so, for it is not mine own. Are you at leisure, Holy Father, now, or shall I come to you at evening mass? My leisure serves me, pensive daughter, now. My lord, we must entreat the time alone. God shield I should disturb devotion. Juliet, on Thursday early will I rouse you. Till then, adieu, and keep this holy kiss. Exit. Oh, shut the door! 
and when thou hast done so, come weep with me, past hope, past cure, past help. Ah, Juliet, I already know thy grief. It strains me past the compass of my wits. I hear thou must, and nothing may prorogue it. On Thursday next be married to this county. Tell me not, fire, that thou hearest of this, unless thou tell me how I may prevent it. If in thy wisdom thou canst give no help, do thou but call my resolution wise, and with this knife I'll help it presently. God joined my heart and Romeo's, thou our hands, and ere this hand by thee to Romeo's sealed shall be the label to another deed, or my true heart with treacherous revolt turn to another, this shall slay them both. Therefore, out of thy long-experienced time, give me some present counsel, or behold, twixt my extremes and me, this bloody knife shall play the empire, arbitrating that which the commission of thy years and art could to no issue of true honour bring. Be not so long to speak, I long to die, if what thou speak'st speak not of remedy. Hold, daughter, I do spy a kind of hope which craves as desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. If, rather than to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength of will to slay thyself, then it is likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chide away the shame that copsed with death himself to scrape from it. And if thou darest, I'll give thee remedy. Oh, bid me leap rather than marry Paris from off the battlements of yonder tower, or walk in thievish ways, or bid me lurk where serpents are, chain me with roaring bears, or shut me nightly in a charnel house, or covered quite with dead men's rattling bones, with reeky shanks and yellow chapless skulls, or bid me go into a new-made grave and hide me with a dead man in his shroud. Things that, to hear them told, have made me tremble and I will do it without fear or doubt to live an unstained wife to my sweet love. Hold, then. Go home. Be merry. Give consent to marry Paris. Wednesday is to-morrow. To-morrow night, look that thou lie alone. Let not thy nurse lie with thee in thy chamber. Take thou this vial. Be then in bed, and this distilled liquor drink thou off. When, presently, through all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humour, for no pulse shall keep his native progress but surcease. No warmth, no breath, shall testify thou livest. The roses in thy lips and cheeks shall fade to paly ashes. Thy eyes' windows fall like death when he shuts up the day of life. Each part, deprived of subtle government, shall, stiff and stark and cold, appear like death. And in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death thou shalt continue two and forty hours, and then awake as from a pleasant sleep. Now, when the bridegroom in the morning comes to rise thee from thy bed, there art thou dead. Then, as the manner of our country is, in thy best robes, uncovered on the bier, thou shalt be borne to the same ancient vault where all the kindreds of the Capulets lie. In the meantime, against thou should awake, shall Romeo by my letters know our drift, and hither shall he come, and he and I will watch thy waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee hence to Mantua, and this shall free thee from this present shame, if no inconstant toy nor womanish fear abate thy valour in the acting it. Give me, give me, oh, tell me not of fear. Hold, get you gone, be strong and prosperous in this resolve. I'll send a friar with speed to Mantua, with my letters to thy lord. Love, give me strength, and strength shall help afford. Farewell, dear father. Exit. Scene two. Hall in Capulet's house. Enter Capulet, Lady Capulet, nurse, and servants. So many guests invite as here are it. Exit. First servant. 
Sirrah, go hire me twenty cunning cooks. You shall have none ill, sir, for I'll try if they can lick their fingers. How canst thou try them so? Marry, sir, tis an ill cook that cannot lick his own fingers. Therefore he that cannot lick his fingers goes not with me. Go, be gone. Exit, second servant. We shall be much unfurnished for this time. What, is my daughter gone to Friar Lawrence? Ay, forsooth. Well, we may chance to do some good on her. A peevish, self-willed harlotry it is. See where she comes from shrift with merry look. Enter Juliet. How now, my headstrong? Where have you been gadding? Where I have learned me to repent the sin of disobedient opposition to you and your behests, and am enjoined by holy Lawrence to fall prostrate here, to beg your pardon. Pardon, I beseech you. Henceforward I am ever ruled by you. Send for the county. Go tell him of this. I'll have this not knit up to-morrow morning. I met the youthful lord at Lawrence's cell, and gave him what becomed love I might, not stepping o'er the bounds of modesty. Why, I am glad on't. This is well. Stand up. This is as should be. Let me see the county. I marry, go, I say, and fetch him hither. Now, for God, this reverend holy friar, all our whole city is much bound to him. Nurse, will you go with me into my closet, to help me sort such needful ornaments as you think fit to furnish me to-morrow? No, not till Thursday. There is time enough. Go, nurse, go with her. We'll to church to-morrow. Exit, Juliet and Nurse. We shall be short in our provision. Tis now near night. Tush, I will stir about, and all things shall be well, I warrant thee, wife. Go thou to Juliet, help to deck up her. I'll not to bed to-night. Let me alone, I'll play the housewife for this once. What? Ho! Oh, they are all forth. Well, I will walk myself to County Paris to prepare him up. Against to-morrow my heart is wondrous light, since this same wayward girl is so reclaimed. Exit. Scene three. Juliet's chamber. Enter Juliet and nurse. Ay, those attires are best. But, gentle nurse, I pray thee, leave me to myself to-night, for I have need of many orisons to move the heavens to smile upon my state, which well thou knowest is cross and full of sin. Enter Lady Capulet. What? Are you busy, ho? Huh? Need you my help? No, madam. We have called such necessaries as are behoveful for our state to-morrow. So please you, let me now be left alone, and let the nurse this night sit up with you, for I am sure you have your hands full all in this so sudden business. Good night. Get thee to bed and rest, for thou hast need. Exit, Lady Capulet and Nurse. Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint, cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse! What should she do here? My dismal scene I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married, then, to-morrow morning? No, no, this shall forbid it. Lie thou there. Laying down her dagger. What if it be a poison, which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonoured, because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is. And yet methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. I will not entertain so bad a thought. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There's a fearful point. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault, to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in, and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Or if I live, is it not very like the horrible conceit of death and night, together with the terror of the place, as in a vault, an ancient receptacle, where for this many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed, where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shroud? Whereas they say at some hours in the night spirits resort. Alack, alack, is it not like that I, so early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad? Or if I wake, 
shall I not be distraught and violent with all these hideous fears, and madly play with my forefather's joints, and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud, and in this rage with some great kinsman's bone as with a club dash out my desperate brains? Oh, look! Methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay! Romeo! I come. This do I drink to thee. Throws herself on the bed. Scene four, Hall in Capulet's house. Enter Lady Capulet and Nurse. Hold, take these keys and fetch more spices, nurse. They call for dates and quinces in the pastry. Enter Capulet. Come, stir, stir, stir. The second cock hath crowed. The curfew bell hath rung. Tis three o'clock. Look to the baked meats, good Angelica. Spare not for cost. Go, you cart queen, go. Get you to bed. Faith, you'll be sick to-morrow for this night's watching. No, not a whit. What? I have watched ere now all night for lesser cause, and ne'er been sick. Ay, you have been a mouse hunt in your time. But I will watch you from such watching now. Exit, Lady Capulet and Nurse. A jealous hood, a jealous hood. Now, fellow. Enter servants with spits, logs, and baskets. What's there? Things for the cook, sir. But I know not what. Make haste, make haste. Exit first servant. Sirrah, fetch drier logs. Call Peter. He will show thee where they are. I have a head, sir, that will find out logs. I never trouble Peter for the matter. Exit. Mass and well said, a merry horsem. Ha! Thou shalt be long ahead. Good faith. Tis day. The county will be here with music straight, for so he said he would. I hear him near. Music within. Nurse! Wife! What ho! What nurse, I say! Re-enter nurse. Go waken Juliet. Go and trim her up. I'll go and chat with Paris. Hi! Make haste! Make haste! The bridegroom, he is come already. Make haste, I say. Exit. Scene five. Juliet's chamber. Juliet on the bed. Enter nurse. Mistress? What mistress? Juliet? Fast, I warrant her. She... Why, lamb? Why, lady? Fie, you slug a bed. Why, love, I say, madam, sweetheart. Why, bride? What, not a word? You take your pennyworths now. Sleep for a week. For the next night, I warrant, the county Paris hath set up his rest, that you shall rest but little. God forgive me. Mary and amen. How sound is she asleep? I needs must wake her. Madam, madam, madam. Ay, let the county take you in your bed. He'll fright you up, if faith. Will it not be? What, dressed? And in your clothes? And down again? I must needs wake you. Lady, lady, lady! Alas, alas, help, help, my lady's dead! Oh, well a day that ever I was born! Some aquavite, ho, oh, my lord, my lady! Enter Lady Capulet. What noise is here? Oh, lamentable day! What is the matter? Look, look, oh, heavy day! Oh, me! Oh, me! My child! My only life! Revive! Look up, or I will die with thee! Help! Help! Call help! Enter Capulet. For shame! Bring Juliet forth! Her lord is come! She's dead, deceased! She's dead! Alack the day! Alack the day! She's dead! She's dead! She's dead! Ha! Let me see her! Out! Alas! She's cold! Her blood is settled, and her joints are stiff. Life and these lips have long been separated. Death lies on her like an untimely frost upon the sweetest flower of all the field. A cursed time! Unfortunate old man! Oh, lamentable day! Oh, woeful time! Death that hath ta'en her hence to make me wail, ties up my tongue, will not let me speak. Enter Friar Lawrence and Paris, 
with musicians. Come, is the bride ready to go to church? Ready to go, but never to return. O oh, son, the night before thy wedding day hath death lain with thy bride. There, there she lies, flower as she was, deflowered by him. Death is my son-in-law, death is my heir, my daughter he hath wedded. I will die and leave him all. Life, living, all is death's. Have I thought long to see this morning's face? And doth it give me such a sight as this? A cursed, unhappy, wretched, hateful day, most miserable hour that e'er time saw in lasting labour of his pilgrimage. But one, poor one, one poor and loving child, but one thing to rejoice and solace in, and cruel death hath catched it from my sight. O oh, woe, O oh, woeful, woeful, woeful day, most lamentable day, most woeful day that ever, ever I did yet behold. O oh, day, O oh, day, O oh, day, O oh, hateful day, never was seen so black a day as this. O oh, woeful day, O oh, woeful day. Beguiled, divorced, wronged, spited, slain. Most detestable death, by thee beguiled, by cruel, cruel thee, quite overthrown. O love, O life, not life, but love in death. Despised, distressed, hated, martyred, killed, uncomfortable time, why comest thou now to murder, murder our solemnity? O child, O child, my soul and not my child. Dead art thou dead? Alack, my child is dead, and with my child my joys are buried. Peace, ho, for shame. Confusion's cure lives not in these confusions. Heaven and yourself had part in this fair maid. Now heaven hath all, and all the better it is for the maid. Your part in her you could not keep from death. But heaven keeps his part in eternal life. And most you sought was her promotion, for twas your heaven she should be advanced. And weep ye now, seeing she is advanced above the clouds, as high as heaven itself. Oh, in this love you love your child so ill that you run mad, seeing that she is well. She's not well married that lives married long, but she's best married that dies married young. Dry up your tears and stick your rosemary on this fair course, and, as the custom is, in all her best array, bear her to church. For though fond nature bids us all lament, yet nature's tears are reason's merriment. All things that we ordain festival turn from their office to black funeral. Our instruments to melancholy bells, our wedding cheer to a sad burial feast, our solemn hymns to sullen dirges change, our bridal flowers serve for a buried course, and all things change them to the contrary. Sir, go you in, and madam, go with him. And go, Sir Paris, every one prepare to follow his fair course into her grave. The heavens do lower upon you for some ill. Move them no more by crossing their high will. Exit Capulet, Lady Capulet, Paris, and Friar. Faith, we may put up our pipes and be gone. Honest good fellows, ah, put up, put up, for well you know this is a pitiful case. Exit. Ay, by my troth, the case may be amended. Enter Peter. Musicians, O oh, musicians, heart's ease, heart's ease. Oh, and you will have me live, play heart's ease. Why heart's ease? O oh, musicians, because my heart itself plays, my heart is full of woe. Oh, play me some merry dump to comfort me. Not a dump, we. Tis no time to play now. You will not, then? 
No. I will then give it you soundly. What will you give us? No money on my face but the gleek. I will give you the minstrel. Then will I give you the serving creature. Then will I lay the serving creature's dagger on your pate. I will carry no crotches. I'll ray you, I'll far you. Do you note me? And you ray us and far us, you note us. Pray you, put up your dagger, and put out your wit. Then have at you with my wit. I will dry-beat you with an iron wit, and put up my iron dagger. Answer me like men, when griping grief the heart doth round, and doleful dumps the mind oppress, then music with her silver sound. Why silver sound? Why music with her silver sound? What say you, Simon Catling? Marry, sir, because silver hath a sweet sound. Pretty. What say you, Hugh Rebeck? I say silver sound, because musicians sound for silver. Pretty too. What say you, James Soundpost? Faith, I know not what to say. Oh, I cry you mercy. You are the singer. I will say for you. It is music with her silver sound, because musicians have no gold for sounding. Then music with her silver sound, with speedy help, doth lend redress. Exit. What a pestilent knave is this same. Hang him, Jack. Come, we will in here. Tarry for the mourners, and stay dinner. Exit. End of Act 4《Act V of Romeo and Juliet》by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act V, Scene One, Mantua, a street. Enter Romeo. If I may trust the flattering eye of sleep, my dreams presage some joyful news at hand. My bosom's lord sits lightly in his throne, And all this day an unaccustomed spirit Lifts me above the ground with cheerful thoughts. I dreamt my lady came and found me dead. Strange dream that gives a dead man leave to think, And breathed such life with kisses in my lips That I revived and was an emperor. Ah, me! How sweet is love itself possessed, When but love's shadows are so rich in joy. Enter Balthazar. News from Verona. How now, Balthazar? Dost thou not bring me letters from the friar? How doth my lady? Is my father well? How fares my Juliet? That I ask again, For nothing can be ill if she be well. Then she is well, and nothing can be ill. Her body sleeps in Capel's monument and her immortal part with angels lives. I saw her laid low in her kindred's vault, and presently took post to tell it you. Oh, pardon me for bringing these ill news, since you did leave it for my office, sir. Is it even so? Then I defy you, stars. Thou know'st my lodging. Get me ink and paper and hire post-horses. I will hence to-night. I do beseech you, sir, have patience. Your looks are pale and wild, and do import some misadventure. Tush, thou art deceived. Leave me, and do the thing I bid thee do. Hast thou no letters to me from the friar? No, my good lord. No matter. Get thee gone, and hire those horses. I'll be with thee straight. Exit, Balthazar. Well, Juliet, I will lie with thee to-night. Let's see for means. O oh, mischief, thou art swift to enter in the thoughts of desperate men. I do remember an apothecary, and hereabouts he dwells, which late I noted in tattered weeds with overwhelming brows, culling of simples, meagre with his looks. Sharp misery had worn him to the bones, and in his needy shop a tortoise hung, an alligator stuffed, and other skins of ill-shaped fishes, and about his shelves 
a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthen pots, bladders and musty seeds, remnants of pack-thread and old cakes of roses, were thinly scattered to make up a show. Noting this penury, to myself I said, and if a man did need a poison now, whose sale is present death in Mantua, here lives a caitiff wretch would sell it him. Oh, this same thought did but forerun my need, and this same needy man must sell it me. As I remember, this should be the house, being holiday the beggar's shop is shut. What ho, apothecary! Enter, apothecary. Who calls so loud? Come hither, man. I see that thou art poor. Hold, there is forty ducats. Let me have a dram of poison, such soon speeding gear as will disperse itself through all the veins that the life-weary taker may fall dead, and that the trunk may be discharged of breath as violently as hasty powder fired doth hurry from the fatal cannon's womb. Such mortal drugs I have, but Mantua's law is death to any he that utters them. Art thou so bare and full of wretchedness and fierce to die? Famine is in thy cheeks, need and oppression starveth in thine eyes, contempt and beggary hangs upon thy back, the world is not thy friend, nor the world's law, the world affords no law to make thee rich. Then be not poor, but break it, and take this. My poverty, but not my will, consents. I pay thy poverty, and not thy will. Put this in any liquid thing you will, and drink it off, and if you had the strength of twenty men it would dispatch you straight. There is thy gold, worse poison to men's souls, doing more murders in this loathsome world than these poor compounds that thou mayst not sell. I sell thee poison, thou hast sold me none. Farewell, buy food and get thyself in flesh. Come, cordial and not poison, go with me to Juliet's grave. For there must I use thee. Exit. Scene two. Friar Lawrence's cell. Enter Friar John. Holy Franciscan Friar. Brother, ho. Enter Friar Lawrence. The same voice be the voice of Friar John. Welcome from Mantua. What says Romeo? Or, if his mind be writ, give me his letter. Going to find a barefoot brother out one of our order, to associate me, here in the city visiting the sick, and finding him, the searchers of the town, suspecting that we both were in a house where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors, and would not let us forth, so that my speed to Mantua was there stayed. Who bear my letter then to Romeo? I could not send it. Here it is again. Nor get a messenger to bring it thee, so fearful were they of infection. Unhappy fortune! By my brotherhood the letter was not nice, but full of charge of dear import, and the neglecting it may do much danger. Friar John, go hence, get me an iron crow, and bring it straight unto my cell. Brother, I'll go and bring it thee. Exit. Now must I to the monument alone. Within this three hours will fair Juliet wake. She will beshrew me much that Romeo hath had no notice of these accidents. But I will write again to Mantua, and keep her at my cell till Romeo come. Poor living corse, closed in a dead man's tomb. Exit. Scene three. A churchyard. In it a monument belonging to the Capulets. Enter Paris and his page, bearing flowers and a torch. Give me thy torch, boy. Hence, and stand aloof. Yet put it out, for I would not be seen. Under yon yew tree lay thee all along, Holding thine ear close to the hollow ground. So shall no foot upon the churchyard tread, Being loose, unfirm with digging up of graves. But thou shalt hear it. Whistle then to me, as signal that thou hearst something approach. Give me those flowers. Do as I bid thee, go! Aside. I am almost afraid to stand alone here in the churchyard, yet I will adventure. Retires. Sweet flower, with flowers thy bridal bed I strew. 
O woe! Thy canopy is dust and stones, With which sweet water nightly will I do, Or wanting that, with tears distilled by moans, The obsequies that I for thee will keep, Nightly shall be to strew thy grave and weep. The page whistles. The boy gives warning something doth approach. What cursed foot wanders this way to-night To cross my obsequies and true love's right? What, with a torch? Muffle me, knight, a while. Retires. Enter Romeo and Balthazar with a torch, mattock, and crowbar. Give me that mattock and the wrenching iron. Hold, take this letter. Early in the morning see thou deliver it to my lord and father. Give me the light. Upon thy life I charge thee, whate'er thou hearest or seest, stand all aloof and do not interrupt me in my course. Why I descend into this bed of death is partly to behold my lady's face, but chiefly to take thence from her dead finger a precious ring, a ring that I must use in dear employment. Therefore hence be gone. But if thou, jealous, dost return to pry in what I further shall intend to do, by heaven I will tear thee joint by joint, and strew this hungry churchyard with thy limbs. The time and my intents are savage wild, more fierce and more inexorable far than empty tigers or the roaring sea. I will be gone, sir, and not trouble you. So shalt thou show me friendship. Take thou that, live and be prosperous, and farewell, good fellow. For all this the same, I'll hide me hereabout. His looks I fear, and his intents I doubt. Retires. Thou detestable moor, thou womb of death, gorged with the dearest morsel of the earth, Thus I enforce thy rotten jaws to open. Breaking open the door of the monument. And in despite, I'll cram thee with more food. That is that banished haughty Montague that murdered my love's cousin. With which grief, it is supposed, the fair creature died. And here is come to do some villainous shame to the dead bodies. I will apprehend him. Advances. Stop thy unhallowed toil, vile Montague. Can vengeance be pursued further than death? Condemned villain, I do apprehend thee. Obey and go with me, for thou must die. I must indeed, and therefore came I hither. Good, gentle youth, tempt not a desperate man. Fly hence and leave me. Think upon these gone. Let them affright thee. I beseech thee, youth, put not another sin upon my head by urging me to fury. Oh, be gone! By heaven, I love thee better than myself, for I come hither armed against myself. Stay not, be gone, live, and hereafter say, a madman's mercy bid thee run away. I do defy thy conjurations, and apprehend thee for a felon here. Wilt thou provoke me? Then have at thee, boy. They fight. O oh Lord, they fight. I will go call the watch. Exit. Oh, I am slain. Falls. If thou be merciful, open the tomb. Lay me with Juliet. Dies. In faith, I will. Let me peruse this face. Oh, Mercutio's kinsman, noble county Paris. What said my man when my betossed soul did not attend him as we rode? I think he told me Paris should have married Juliet. Said he not so? Or did I dream it so? Or am I mad, hearing him talk of Juliet, to think it was so? Oh, give me thy hand. One writ with me in sour misfortune's book. I'll bury thee in a triumphant grave. A grave? Oh, no, 
a lanthorn slaughtered youth for here lies juliet and her beauty makes this vault a feasting presence full of light death lie thou there by a dead man interred laying paris in the monument how oft when men are at the point of death have they been merry which their keepers call a lightning before death oh how may i call this a lightning oh my love my wife death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty thou art not conquered beauty's ensign yet is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks and death's pale flag is not advanced there. Tybalt, liest thou there in thy bloody sheet? Oh, what more favour can I do to thee than with that hand that cut thy youth in twain to sunder his that was thine enemy? Forgive me, cousin. Ah, dear Juliet! why art thou yet so fair shall i believe that unsubstantial death is amorous and that the lean abhorred monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour for fear of that i still will stay with thee and never from this palace of dim night depart again here here will i remain with worms that are thy chambermaids oh here will i set up my everlasting rest and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh eyes look your last arms take your last embrace and lips oh you the doors of breath seal with a righteous kiss a dateless bargain to engrossing death come bitter conduct come unsavoury guide thou desperate pilot now at once run on the dashing rocks thy sea-sick weary bark here's to my love drinks oh true apothecary my drugs are quick thus with a kiss i die dies Enter at the other end of the churchyard, Friar Lawrence, with a lantern, crow, and spade. St. Francis, be my speed. How oft to-night have my old feet stumbled at graves. Who there? Who is it that consorts, so late the dead? Here's one, a friend, and one that knows you well. Bliss be upon you. Tell me, good friend, what torch is yon that vainly lends its light to grubs and eyeless skulls? As I discern, it burneth in the capel's monument. It doth so, holy sir, and there's my master, one that you love. Who is it? Romeo. How long hath he been there? Full half an hour. Go with me to the vault. I dare not, sir. My master knows not, but I am gone hence, and fearfully did menace me with death if I did stay to look on his intents. Stay then. I'll go alone. Fear comes upon me. Oh, much I fear some ill, unlucky thing. As I did sleep under this yew tree here, I dreamt my master and another fought, and that my master slew him. Romeo advances. Alack, alack! What blood is this which stains the stony entrance of this sepulchre? What mean these masterless and gory swords to lie discolored by this palace of peace? Enters the monument. Romeo, O oh, pale! Who else? What? Paris, too? And steeped in blood? Ah, what an unkind hour is guilty of this lamentable chance! The lady stirs. Juliet wakes and stirs. O oh, comfortable friar, where is my lord? I do remember well where I should be, and there I am. Where is my Romeo? Noise within. I hear some noise. Lady, come from that nest of death, contagion, and unnatural sleep. A greater power than we can contradict 
hath thwarted our intents. Come, come away. Thy husband in thy bosom there lies dead. And Paris too. Come, I'll dispose of thee among a sisterhood of holy nuns. Stay not to question, for the watch is coming. Come, go, good Juliet. Noise within. I dare no longer stay. Go, get thee hence, for I will not away. Exit Friar Lawrence. What's here? A cup closed in my true love's hand. Poison, I see, hath been his timeless end. O oh, churl, drunk all, and left no friendly drop to help me after. I will kiss thy lips. Haply some poison yet doth hang on them to make me die with a restorative. Kisses him. <gasps> thy lips are warm. Within. Lead, boy. Which way? Yea, noise. Then I'll be brief. O oh, happy dagger! Snatching Romeo's dagger. This is thy sheath. Stabs herself. There rest, and let me die. Falls on Romeo's body and dies. Enter watch with the page of Paris. This is the place there where the torch doth burn. The ground is bloody. Search about the churchyard. Go some of you where you find a tatch. Exit some of the watch. Oh, pitiful sight. Here lies the county slain, and Juliet bleeding, warm and newly dead, who here hath lain these two days buried. Go, tell the prince, run to the Capulets, raise up the Montagues, some others search. Exit others of the watch. We see the ground where all these woes do lies, but the true ground of all these piteous woes we cannot without circumstance decry. Re-enter some of the watch with Balthazar. Here's Romeo's man. We've found him in the churchyard. Hold him in safety till the prince come hither. Re-enter others of the watch with Friar Lawrence. Here is a friar that trembles, sighs, and weeps. We took this mattock and this spade from him, as he was coming from this churchyard side. A great suspicion. Stay the prior too. Enter prince and attendants. What misadventure is so early up that calls our person from our morning's rest? Enter Capulet, Lady Capulet, and others. What should it be that they so shriek abroad? The people in the street cry Romeo, some Juliet, and some Paris, and all run with open outcry toward our monument. What fear is this which startles in our ears? Sovereign. Here lies the county Paris slain, and Romeo dead, and Juliet dead before, warm and new killed. Search, seek, and know how this foul murder comes. Here is a friar, and slaughtered Romeo's man, with instruments upon them fit to open these dead men's tombs. Oh, heaven! Oh, wife! Look how our daughter bleeds! This dagger hath me stained for... Lo, his house is empty on the back of Montague, and it missheathed in my daughter's bosom. O oh me, this sight of death is as a bell that warns my old age to a sepulchre. Enter Montague and others. Come, Montague, for thou art early up, to see thy son and heir more early down. Alas, my liege, my wife is dead to-night. Grief of my son's exile hath stopped her breath. What further woe conspires against mine age? Look, and thou shalt see. O oh, thou untaught! What manners is in this, To press before thy father to a grave? Seal up the mouth of outrage for a while, Till we can clear these ambiguities, And know their spring, their head, their true descent. And then will I be general of your woes, And lead you even to death. Meantime, forbear and let mischance be slave to patience bring forth the parties of suspicion i am the greatest able to do least yet most suspected as the time and place doth make against me of this direful murder and here i stand both to impeach and purge myself condemned and myself excused then say at once what thou dost know in this i will be brief for my short date of breath 
is not so long as is a tedious tale. Romeo, there dead, was husband to that Juliet, and she there dead, that Romeo's faithful wife. I married them, and their stolen marriage day was Tybalt's doomsday, whose ultimate death banished the new-made bridegroom from this city, for whom, and not for Tybalt, Juliet pined. You, to remove that siege of grief from her, betrothed, and would have married her perforce to County Paris. Then she comes to me, and with wild looks bid me devise some means to rid her of this second marriage, or in my cell there would she kill herself. Then gave her I, so tutored by my art, a sleeping potion, which so took effect as I intended, for it wrought on her the form of death. Meantime I writ to Romeo that he should hither come as this dire night, to help to take her from her borrowed grave, being the time the potion's force should cease. But he who bore my letter, Friar John, was stayed by accident, and yesternight returned my letter back. Then all alone, at the prefixed hour of her waking, came I to take her from her kindred's vault, meaning to keep her closely at my cell till I conveniently could send to Romeo. And when I came, some minute ere the time of her waking, here untimely lay the noble Paris and true Romeo dead. She awakes, and I entreat her, come forth and bear this work of heaven with patience. And then a noise did scare me from the tomb, and she too, desperate, would not go with me, but as it seems, did violence on herself. All this I know, and to the marriage her nurse is privy. And if aught in this miscarried by my fault, let my own life be sacrificed, some hour before his time, unto the rigor of severest law. We still have known thee for a holy man. Where's Romeo's man? What can he say in this? I brought my master news of Juliet's death and then in post he came from Mantua to this same place, to this same monument. This letter he early bid me give his father, and threatened me with death going in the vault. I departed not, and left him there. Give me the letter. I will look on it. Where is the county's page that raised the watch? Sirrah, what made your master in this place? He came with flowers to strew his lady's grave and bid me stand aloof, and so I did. Anon comes one with light to ope the tomb, and by and by my master drew on him. And then I ran away to call the watch. This letter doth make good the friar's words, their cause of love, the tidings of her death. And here he writes that he did buy a poison of a poor apothecary, and therewithal come to this vault to die and lie with Juliet. Where be these enemies? Capulet, Montague, see what scourge is laid upon your hate, that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love. And I, for winking at your discords too, have lost a brace of kinsmen. All are punished. O oh, brother Montague, give me thy hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. But I can give thee more, for I will raise her statue in pure gold, that while Verona by that name is known, there shall no figure at such rate be set as that of true and faithful Juliet. As rich shall Romeo's by his ladies lie, poor sacrifices of our enmity. A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun, for sorrow, will not show its head. Go hence, to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned, and some punished. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. Excellent. End of Act 5 End of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare